Last month, I asked on my community tab, which of these videos would you rather see? And the overwhelming response was if I wrote Arkham Origins 2. Needless to say, I didn't realize what I got myself into. This is the most fun I've had writing a video in a long time, but God, was it stressful and all-consuming. I actually just had a dream about Catwoman last night, which isn't something I'm complaining about. I really wanted to get this as perfect as I could, which is to say, not perfect at all, but I'm pretty happy with it. To caveat the incoming ocean of words I'm about to spew, I'm no professional writer, and I've certainly never written a video game story. That will become obvious to you throughout this video, but the goal here was to have a fun time and imagine an alternate reality where Arkham Origins 2 actually happened. What would that look like? What would I want to see? So, before we get into the weeds, I want to share my ground rules for this story and provide some context for the plot. The Arkham Universe canon is a bit messy if you pay attention to material outside of the games. Even the new Rocksteady game seems to be messing with the canon. So, for the sake of this story, I'm ignoring everything outside of the core five games. I'm sure the comic stories have their fans, but Rocksteady and WB Montreal were never pigeonholed by spin-off comics, so I won't be either. I want to try and tell the best story I can, picking up thematically where Arkham Origins left off, further fleshing out the story arc of a younger Batman becoming the man we meet in Arkham Asylum, without worrying about where specifically Harley Quinn was on this date from that random comic. With that said, this is still a video game, and I made an effort to describe how I envision each level playing out, as well as gameplay elements, but to be honest, those are the areas of this video that I have the least confidence in. I'm definitely not a game designer. However, it was important to me to keep the player front and center, describing what the player does to get from point A to point B. This isn't a movie, this isn't a TV show, this is a video game, and gameplay needs to be the driving factor. Sometimes I think I have a good idea and lay out my vision of gameplay, other times I keep things vaguer. My hope is that I'm able to present a rough enough idea of what's going on, and that you're familiar enough with the Arkham franchise that you can fill in some gameplay gaps so no one is ever lost. Also, while I'm covering my ass, it's going to be impossible for me to line up 99% of what I'm discussing with any visuals on screen. I'll try my best, but for the most part you're just going to be looking at random gameplay. I apologize, but this game simply does not exist. Now it's time to set the stage. Batman Arkham Origins 2, or as I've taken to calling it, Batman Arkham Bonds, is set early in Bruce's fourth year of crime fighting. Parts of my story are heavily influenced by Batman Chronicles The Gauntlet and Batman Dark Victory. Great reads, you should definitely check them out. Due to the events of Arkham Origins, people know that Batman is real, but he's still an enigma who public servants won't officially recognize. Gotham is a fragmented city during this time. Batman and Captain Gordon are just getting started, and there are a lot of entrenched institutions that need to be burned down. The night is always darkest before the dawn, and the chaos of gang warfare is a direct result of their actions. On the crime front, a good part of this game is about the last gasp of Gotham's original criminal empire and the coinciding rise of the Freaks. This is the nickname old school criminals call your typical Batman supervillain. They've begun to emerge during this era of chaos, planting roots of their own to thrive in the future. That's why you'll see supervillains you're familiar with acting a little more foolish and immature. I wanted to provide an incontinuity time period where these villains had just a tinge of Silver Age camp. Like Batman, many of these villains are just getting their start and are not close to the characters we'd meet in Asylum, let alone who they become by the time night wraps up. One final thing before getting started. In this story, I'm breaking with two major Arkham traditions. One I'll tell you about now, and the other you can guess for yourself once you get to the end. I'm not having the events of this game take place over one night. I think that narrative device has pushed itself beyond the point of believability. This game will take place over about a week, and it will be obvious when the days pass. Now that we've established where Batman is in his career, and the current state of Gotham City, let the game begin. The game opens with a bird lost in the Batcave. As it soars over a base that has clearly been upgraded since the prior game, it is swarmed by bats. 
their dark cloud envelops the frame, and we cut to a 15-year-old Dick Grayson suiting up as Robin for the first time. Batman is waiting for him near the Batwing. The player is informed through exposition dialogue that Dick has been training for six months and this is his final test. If he passes, he will be able to join Batman in the field. Dick simply has to hide in Gotham for one whole night. Alfred doesn't necessarily approve, but understands this is something important to the both of them and wishes Dick luck as the pair head into the Batwing. Dick is excited and cocky and nervous as the gameplay begins with him dive bombing out into the Gotham City skyline. Batman will start looking for him in 30 minutes. This is a great time to familiarize the player with how Robin will play in this game. It's a tightrope walk, but since Robin will be a major part of it, it's critical that he plays differently than Batman while maintaining enough similarity so it doesn't feel jarring. To bring some cohesion to his traversal, I want to do something that none of the other Arkham games ever did and give Robin a dive bomb. Firstly, because that feature is just so cool, and secondly, it never made sense that anyone who could glide wouldn't be able to do that. I would also give Robin a double jump and balance him out with a more limited glide capability, decrease speed and rage. Ultimately, my goal is to separate Robin by making him more acrobatic and quicker on his feet, but without the power to soar as fast or as long as Batman. I feel this creates a different enough playstyle for both, which fits within their canonical skills, while making Batman ultimately superior in traversal, but not as fun in basic movement. With the test started, after a certain point, an event is triggered where Robin comes across a man being beaten in an alleyway. Rather than continuing to run, Robin takes it upon himself to help. The thugs are interrogating this man for answers, calling him a rat as they beat him. From dialogue, it's obvious they work for Carmine Falcone. When Robin jumps in to save the man, he has to fight off about five goons, but the final one manages to escape with a hostage in his car. Robin tracks the car, wondering how Batman would handle this situation, until he arrives at a Falcone safe house. The head goon drags the rat into the hideout, which is guarded by gunmen. Before infiltrating the hideout, Robin has to stealthily take them all down. Once inside, Robin listens in on the goons talking about their current situation. Falcone has been ramping up operations lately since he's fighting a war on two fronts against Gordon and the Penguin. The head thug, Del Kane, bemoans the rise of more freaks in the city, like Penguin, Batman, and the kid they just encountered. While Robin is silently taking out the room, Del Kane starts torturing the rat, asking him what he knows about Alberto Falcone going missing. He clearly believes the Penguin took him. Once the room is clear, Robin lures Del Kane out into the open, away from the hostage. Del Kane summons backup, and Robin has to fight through a small army of mafiosos, including Del Kane, who is built like a brick shithouse and serves as a miniboss. When they're all defeated, Robin emerges from the safe house with the hostage over his shoulder, only to be greeted by a number of police cars on the outside. Standing in front of the headlights, are Batman and Captain Gordon. Gordon barks orders at his men to arrest everyone in the hideout while paramedics take the hostage from Robin's arms. Batman tells Robin that he did good, that the hostage was a police informant with valuable information on Falcone operations. Robin asks how he and the police got here so quickly, and Batman admits that he found Robin during the car chase, but watched him handle himself with great skill. Robin's bummed that Batman found him so easily and thinks that he failed the test, but Batman assures him that he passed. He introduces an ecstatic Robin to Gordon as the camera pans up onto the same bird from the beginning, now flying freely across Gotham's skyline. Flash forward one month. Batman and Robin come soaring onto the player's screen, dashing across rooftops. Robin is having a blast. Batman tries to calm him down, but can't help smiling the slightest bit. They're on their way to the bat signal, and Robin challenges Batman to a race. There will be segments of gameplay throughout where the player chooses which character they want to play as. The player picks, and then the race begins. They arrive to find Gordon on top of the GCPD. Although Robin is already friendly with him, Gordon is hesitant with having him around tonight. He asks to speak with Batman alone. Robin resists, but Batman sees the seriousness on Gordon's face and makes Robin wait on a nearby rooftop. Once they're alone, Gordon describes a horrible murder that's taken place tonight. The Warden of Arkham Asylum has been killed in a manner invoking Valentine's Day. But that isn't until next week. They both assume Calendar Man is behind this, 
who recently executed a Groundhog Day themed crime. Gordon asks Batman to investigate the scene. He also adds that it isn't his place, but he'd prefer Batman leave the kid out of this one. He knows Robin is capable, and he's seen more than most, but that doesn't mean he should go looking for more when it can be avoided. After their talk, Batman tells Robin he's handling the crime scene alone, but will call on him when he's done. Batman arrives at the luxurious apartment of Warden Valdis to discover a grisly scene. The Warden was bound to his bed by his hands and feet. Rose petals are littered all over the bed and floor, clearly placed after the murder. Two arrows jut out of the Warden's chest, but upon closer inspection, it appears the Warden was stabbed in the chest multiple times with a different object, likely a knife, that isn't anywhere to be found. There's a poem pinned to the Warden's chest by both arrows. It reads, Unwanted bonds constrict the two lovers. Leash is held by men shrouded in shadow. Freedom only comes when you uncover those holding back little Cupid's arrow. The old falcon corrupts all with his might. Who can best him other than you, Dark Knight? Batman recognizes the rhyme scheme as the last sestet of a Shakespearean sonnet a love poem for Valentine's Day. Wrapping up the crime scene, Batman's conclusion is that someone murdered the warden, and later, someone manipulated the crime scene. Was it the murderer returning, or another person? Did they leave the note, or was it already here? His assumption that this was Calendar Man's doing was already flawed since he never strikes early, and the evidence he's seen further solidifies it was likely someone else. Most curious of all is the poem pointing him specifically in the direction of Carmine Falcone. Calendar Man would never make his crime about anyone other than himself. Batman can't just ignore the poem, though. It's piqued his curiosity. He calls Robin to meet him at coordinates he's sending. Robin asks if he can drive the Batmobile. Batman says, hell no. But he has installed a self-drive feature, so Robin should get in and not touch anything. Robin sighs. So this is when the game opens up for the player to free roam as Batman. Just like all Arkham games, between major missions, the player is free to explore and start some side activities. However, until the end game, you are limited to which character you can use in free roam at a given time. I also will not be going into all the various side missions that would be included in this game. I have some ideas, but I think this video is meaty enough as is. If you want to hear more about what side missions I do, please let me know in the comments. The next mission begins when Batman arrives in an alleyway outside of the main Falcone mob hideout, a massive warehouse on the docks. A completed and upgraded version of the Batmobile from Origins rolls up with Robin inside. He pouts and says driving it would have been more fun. Batman tells him he doesn't care, and they grapple to a rooftop overlooking the hideout. Batman catches Robin up to speed on why they're here, leaving out some of the more gruesome details. Robin asks if criminals often leave obvious clues to help them get caught. Batman tells him he'd be surprised. Robin asks what they're doing just standing around. Batman answers that it could be a trap and patience is a big part of the job. Suddenly, an explosion goes off. Robin says, I guess it's not as important tonight. Batman tells Robin to wait here. He'll call him if he needs backup. Robin protests, but Batman snaps at him before rushing in. The player has two choices how they want to enter. They can either glide kick through a window for a loud entrance, or enter stealthily through a vent grate on the side of the building. Once inside the burning warehouse, Batman finds a number of panicking thugs struggling to put out the fire around them, but upon seeing him, they attack. As Batman is making his way through the warehouse, he's making sure to reactivate the sprinkler system, which has been tampered with, as well as putting out the fire in his own Batman puzzle-solving way. Keep in mind, Arkham level design usually has far more for the player to do than just punch or choke dudes. After making his way through the rest of the level and putting out most of the fire, Batman is set to enter Falcone's office, but it's under heavy protection, and now there's a Predator gameplay situation. Once resolved, a last wave of combatants enters the area. Part of this group are two mini boss bruisers and one goon with a new type of weapon Batman has never seen before, a laser gun. It takes about 10 seconds to charge and it glows a brighter purple the closer it is to firing. The only thing Batman could do to counter it is to dodge. If it hits Batman, that's an automatic half of his health dropped. However, there's just a regular goon wielding the weapon, and Batman can take him down like anyone else given the chance. This gun also cannot be picked up by others in combat since it's attached to a certain type of rig the goon is wearing. Just throwing that out there. With the coast finally clear, 
Batman enters Carmine Falcone's office to find him trapped under some smoldering rubble with three fresh claw scratches bleeding down his face. When Falcone sees Batman, he wheezes that this is just what he needs right now. Batman uses the opportunity to interrogate him about Warden Valdez's murder. Falcone is lost, barely knowing who the Warden is, but of course, the name Arkham rings a bell. Falcone turns the tables, asking Batman that if he's so high and mighty, why hasn't he found his son Alberto? He's been missing for over a month, and he's certain the Penguin had something to do with it. Batman tells him he doesn't get his hands dirty with gang wars. Falcone says soon enough he's going to have to choose a side. The families or the freaks. Batman asks Falcone what the laser gun was, but Falcone passes out from the interrogation continuing the thread established in Origins that Batman is still not the near-flawless master he becomes later on. As Batman pulls Falcone from the rubble, he gets a call from Robin saying he's in pursuit of someone fleeing the scene. Batman grows angry. We back up in time a little to see Robin sitting on that rooftop with his legs dangling off the side, looking bored out of his mind. He mumbles to himself that even if Batman needed his help, he wouldn't call because he thinks of him as just some unlucky kid he has to take care of. Then, he spots a shadowy figure bolt across the smoldering rooftop and vault to the next one. Robin hops up, noting that couldn't be a typical thug and gets excited to prove himself. He calls Batman as the player gives chase after this figure against Batman's protestations. When Robin eventually closes in on this figure, it disappears around a corner. When Robin pauses to recalibrate, the figure strikes him from above, knocking Robin on his ass. It's Catwoman, pinning Robin down with her leg, holding an unmarked bag. Surprised it isn't Batman, Catwoman asks who he's supposed to be. Understandably tongue-tied by a sexy woman with her boot on his chest, he squeaks out that he's Robin. Catwoman says, that's cute, but he should run along. Robin pushes her off him and says that isn't gonna happen resulting in a boss fight where it's clear Catwoman is taking it easy on Robin, which frustrates him. I'm no game designer, so I'll do my best with what I envision the mechanics to be, but for the most part, any gameplay I talk about should be taken with a grain of salt. Since we already know how Catwoman fights from Arkham City, I think it would be cool to have a one versus one fight where Catwoman is mostly playing defensively, rarely outright attacking, and mostly countering Robin's moves. What does that look like? I'm not entirely sure, but maybe Robin has to counter a counter in order to initiate a combo attack that leads to a full-blown strike on Catwoman. The point of this fight is that Robin kinda doesn't stand a chance on his own and watching him struggle with that fact. The boss fight ends when a quick time segment triggers that has the player, out of desperation, throw a number of shuriken at Catwoman. She dodges them easily and taunts him, but Robin smiles and tells her to watch her step. He managed to slice open part of her bag, and some of the contents are spilling out onto the rooftop. Catwoman loses her cool a bit and whips Robin's chest. A cutscene triggers where Robin pushes through the pain and charges at her, but suddenly, Batman soars in and tackles Catwoman to the ground. The two bounce off the rooftop as she shoots out from under him, landing on her feet. You again, Batman asks. Catwoman looks from Batman to Robin and back, then sighs. I should have known you had a kid. I sure know how to pick him. Batman notices her bloodstained claws. You've certainly picked a dangerous man to steal from. Be careful, Batman, Robin interjects. She's quick. Two masters of observation, Catwoman smirks. There's no pulling the wool over your eyes. She's dangerous, Robin. Stay back. But Catwoman launches her whip at Batman, who dodges out of the way. A new round of the boss fight begins with the player controlling Batman, and this time, Catwoman is much more intense. Different mechanics need to be worked out, but I think it could be as simple as putting her on the offensive. What would happen if two Arkham playable characters went at each other? I want to see counters on counters on counters, combos, gadgets, pull out all the stops. The fight ends when Batman creates an opening to pin Catwoman to the ground. Once horizontal, she obviously flirts with him, which throws him off ever so slightly. She says, if only the kid weren't around, then we could have some real fun. Then manages to throw a smoke bomb at Robin, who begins coughing. She whispers one word in Batman's ear. Poison. He immediately jolts over to help Robin, who emerges from the smoke unharmed. Batman grabs his shoulder and asks if he's okay. 
Robin says he is, but asks what happened to the thief. Batman turns around, and Catwoman is gone. He curses himself, but finds that he stepped on one bit of gold from Catwoman's bag. It's a coin engraved with a falcon and the Latin words, Familia est omnia. Family is everything. With the level over, the game transitions to the Batcave, where Robin is sitting on an examination table being looked after by Alfred. He asks if this is really necessary. It's obvious Catwoman was lying so she could escape. Alfred says they can never be too careful. Bruce adds that you can never trust a criminal. He's working on the back computer, trying to piece together the mysteries of the night. He contacts Oracle, aka Barbara Gordon, asking if she can search police files for connection between Warden Valdis and Carmine Falcone. It's not something he can find, but maybe the old police records she has access to might hold some answers. She says she'll be right on it, then asks about Robin. Dick says hi from his table. Bruce thanks her and abruptly cuts off the communicator. He tells Dick this is no time for flirting, but Dick brings up Catwoman, asking what that was all about. Bruce says that she's manipulative like all criminals, a perfect example of why Dick needs to be more careful. Alfred gives Dick a knowing look. They both clearly know there's more going on. Alfred says that Master Richard needn't worry about Catwoman creeping into the manor at night. Master Bruce has recently started seeing the lovely socialite Jaina Hudson, and they're hitting it off already. Bruce grunts in uninterested agreement, Alfred and Dick share another smile, and Alfred tells him that his vitals look fine and he should get some rest. It's well past his already far too lenient bedtime. Bruce says that he'll be working in the cave for a while longer, and Alfred retorts he gave up on enforcing his bedtime long ago. We cut to the next evening. Bruce dons the cape and cowl, and the player is able to explore the Batcave, which has been expanded and upgraded since Origins. At the time, Alfred is the only one available to talk to. I think the cave can function similarly to its role in Origins. It's an in-game hub where the player needs to return for training sessions, cosmetic changes, character interactions, and of course, for story purposes. Once ready, Batman can either take the Batwing or drive the new Batmobile to a fast travel point in Gotham. This is another opportunity for open-world Batman adventuring. When the player is ready, the next mission can begin. Because of Falcone's comments regarding his son Alberto, Batman wants to follow up with Oswald Cobblepot to see if he's involved in this criminal conspiracy. The player finds out that Penguin has continued operating on his massive ship, the final offer, in the years between Origins and the present. However, when the player arrives there, Batman finds that Penguin's gang is clearing the ship out. The player jumps down to kick their asses and interrogates the last goon, who informs Batman that the Penguin has moved operations to the Bowery specifically the old Natural History Museum. The player makes their way across town to find Penguin's men renovating the museum in the process of transforming it into the Iceberg Lounge we know of in Arkham City. However, Penguin is openly waiting for Batman's arrival outside. He has a number of armed thugs at his back for protection, but he wants to talk to the Batman. The player can either choose to take all the goons out before talking to him, or accept the risk and speak with the Penguin properly guarded. The conversation begins with Penguin guessing why Batman is looking for him. He heard about his run-in with Old Man Falcone last night, and assures Batman that he had nothing to do with Alberto going missing. He hasn't seen the brat in months, and even if he did, he isn't worth spitting at. Batman is unsure whether or not to believe Penguin, this is their first encounter like this, and he's iffy about how he should proceed. Penguin suggests that Batman take a walk with him as they discuss his proposal. He asks if the guns make Batman uncomfortable. Batman tells him he's not worried. Penguin smiles and leads him inside his under-renovation headquarters. Penguin essentially fills Batman in on the history of his feud with Falcone that was alluded to during Origins when Penguin did have Alberto kidnapped. Their conversation is tense, but I think it's an interesting relationship to flesh out in a situation unique to these games. The long and short of the conversation, after a brief walk through the museum section and arrival in the nightclub portion, is that Penguin knows Batman is looking to take Falcone down once and for all. Penguin very much likes that idea. Since Falcone has deluded himself into thinking Penguin was part of Alberto's disappearance, violence between their organizations has only increased. That's bad for business and bad for Gotham. Penguin proposes an alliance to take down Falcone together. Batman turns it down right away, but Penguin sweetens the deal telling him that he has contacts the Batman doesn't, intel only a leader of the Gotham underworld can attain. He will provide Batman with that intel and support from some of his best men if he needs it. 
It is a good offer, but Batman has trouble stomaching freeing up territory for Penguin to take over. Ultimately, Batman does agree to a temporary alliance but on the condition that Penguin's men halt all criminal activity for the time being. Penguin surprisingly agrees, stating most of his men will be hard at work on the renovations anyway. Why pay for contractors? He yucks to himself. But when Falcone is toppled, all bets are off. While Penguin will be a significant part of the ongoing story, this will be the last time Batman interacts with him directly for a story mission for quite some time. However, Penguin does introduce a number of side missions that Batman can take on, working to take down Falcone bases throughout the city. There are three of these missions, each one pairing Batman up with some rogues that have been long teased since Arkham Asylum. Tweedledee and Tweedledum, Humpty Dumpty, and Killer Moth. Humpty Dumpty serves as an engineer for Penguin, the Tweedles as his enforcers, and Killer Moth as his assault specialist. Penguin introduces Batman to this gaggle of freaks inside the Iceberg Lounge. Batman has trouble being in the same room as them all, and once everything is agreed to, he leaves. Penguin laughs after him, saying he knows this will be a fruitful partnership for them both. After this, the player is able to go back into free roam again. If they want to, they can begin one of Penguin's side missions, or do a number of other activities throughout the city. Once a certain amount of time passes, the next mission is triggered when Dick calls Batman to ask where he is so he can come join him. Batman asks if he's finished his homework, Dick says, yes. Batman asks if he asked Alfred the same question, would he give him the same answer? Dick says he maybe has a bit more math to do, but he just saw the bat signal go up. Batman sees the same thing and tells him he can handle that on his own. Homework first, then patrol. That's the deal. From here, the player has the choice to stay in free roam or head straight to the signal. When the player does arrive close enough to the GCPD, an event triggers in gameplay where Batman sees Gordon getting in a squad car parked out front. He shouts up to Batman that there isn't time to explain, he just has to follow him immediately. So the player turns around to tail Gordon's car throughout Gotham, only hearing him shout sparse sentences of short exposition until the sound of alarm bells drowns him out completely. Arriving at Gotham National Bank, Batman speaks with Gordon, who is taking command of a freshly organized perimeter. He tells Batman that Arnold Wesker has taken hostages in the bank, with his Scarface gang. The mayor, Marion Grange's fiance, Thomas Elliot, is one of the hostages. Gordon asks Batman to handle the inside. Wesker is unstable, and he's the only one who can ensure no hostages die. Gordon's job is to keep the situation calm and distract Wesker to buy Batman time. Batman sneaks in and does his thing. The crux of this level is to save 20 hostages within a set time constraint, or you fail. There are a number of different rooms, some hostages are lumped together, while others are alone. Each are protected by varying amounts of guards, with numerous ways to take down in no specific order. But if you're spotted in a particular section of the bank, before you can rescue the hostages in that section, then they die and you lose. As for the layout of the bank, that's something you'll need to imagine for yourself. Story-wise, as Batman is doing his thing, He's reflecting on his relationship with Thomas Elliot when they were kids. Each time he spots a hostage, he notes that it isn't Tommy. Through vague and terse Batman-like exposition, we learn that he always liked the Elliot family. After his parents died, Mr. and Mrs. Elliot became friendly aunts and uncles helping out Alfred on occasion. He especially valued his relationship with Tommy. Not many sons of billionaires were around, a lot less his own age. He felt it was a miracle he had someone so similar to himself to spend time with. Tommy would always ask him how he felt about his parents' death. Even years after, he always made a point to ask Bruce. Over the years, Batman's thought that if he had been more honest with his feelings back then, he wouldn't have lost touch with Tommy, even after Tommy's own parents died. Tommy and Bruce had a falling out before Bruce left for his training around the world, which hurt but ultimately, he feels it was for the best. Last he heard, Tommy was living in Metropolis until his recent engagement to the young mayor. Once all the hostage saving is over, and of course the only one left needs to be revealed, enter Scarface on the arm of Arnold Wesker, aka the ventriloquist, leading a bloodied Thomas Elliot down a flight of stairs. Scarface treats Tommy like his meat shield, ordering him to do as he wills and calling him his Tommy gun all the while berating Wesker to do his part of holding their real gun at Tommy's back. Tommy can't get over the outrageousness of the situation and often backtalks his captor, but their attention shifts to Batman. Scarface thanks Batman for arriving, 
his mask will sell for a high price. He orders the remainder of his gang to attack Batman in an open brawl, then jumps into the fray himself, occasionally firing off his weapon, then hiding behind Tommy so Batman cannot attack him. The player needs to constantly dodge bullets while they're fighting the goons. When the ventriloquist goes to reload is when the player has the chance to fight the rest. That gameplay loop repeats a number of times until all the goons are down. A quick time event will trigger as ventriloquist reloads, causing the player to fire a bit of explosive gel onto Scarface's head. Halfway through a Scarface monologue, Batman detonates it, cracking open his wooden skull. Ventriloquist shrieks in horror, and during that moment of surprise, Tommy punches Wesker, knocking him out. Batman has a brief exchange with Tommy, asking if he's alright. Tommy shakes his now broken fist in anger at the whole situation, rambling about the horrible day he's been having. The stress of his upcoming wedding, really just venting. With something else clearly on his mind, Batman merely says, you're safe now. When he turns to leave, Tommy says, wait. Batman pauses and Tommy asks, who are you? Welcome back to Gotham. Batman leaves. A few blocks from the bank, Gordon and Batman talk on the corner of a dark alley. Gordon has information which he had originally put the signal up to talk about. His men leaned on Carmine Falcone as long as they could, but he's got great lawyers and interrogating men in hospital beds is already hard enough. Gordon questions Batman on why he thinks Falcone is wrapped up in the Warden murder. Batman explains the poem, stating that someone must have come after the police had already been there to leave it. Gordon questions why, and Batman explains that it was a clue just for him. Notably, there's an opportunity for Batman to mention Catwoman in this conversation, but he doesn't take it. Instead, Batman asks Gordon if Calendar Man's Groundhog Day crime scene is still sealed off. Gordon tells him it is. The entire floor of the apartment building has been abandoned due to the stench, so no one's in any rush to clean the carpets. Batman's going to revisit it. He doubts Calendar Man is involved, but he wants to be sure there wasn't a clue he missed. At this point in the story, perspectives shift. Batman goes to check out the old crime scene while Dick radios him that he's just finished his homework and he's going out on patrol. Batman tells him to meet him at the crime scene when he can, but this is the first opportunity to engage with the open world as Robin in free roam. It's important that Robin and Batman get their own side activities to do. There can be some shared stuff of course, most collectibles and you know, the less story focused or character reliant side missions, those would be fair game for each. But I think the only way to truly enhance the experience of playing as both characters is to make their experiences feel unique. The worst thing a game could do is make playing as Robin feel like a lesser experience. I think the way to explain the difference in side mission availability is actually really simple. Batman locks Robin out of certain intel so he can't get involved in investigations deemed too dangerous or sensitive. Although, that doesn't stop Robin from pursuing his own cases in secret, which he tracks without Batman's knowledge. Oh, also, I think Robin should be able to access data packs that Batman left throughout the city. Sorry, but no Riddler trophies in this game. Just no. However, the idea of Batman leaving behind little encrypted data sets for Robin to discover, to learn more about the city, its history, and the various characters who inhabit it, could be a really fun concept. Once that free roam is all done, the next mission triggers when the player arrives at the crime scene Batman has holographically reconstructed. It's brutal, but gimmicky, very on the nose. In this case, a weatherman had been locked in a windowless room and trapped with a bunch of rabid, blind groundhogs. To survive, he had to kill them all, and nearly bled out from his injuries, but was rescued due to a good Samaritan. A dark crime, but with a Silver Age silliness to it. Still, Robin looks shaken to be there amongst the remnant fur and bloodstains, but puts on a brave face. Batman breaks down the scene to Robin in a robotic way. It's a teaching moment, but the way he's going about it makes Dick feel worse. The cherry on top is when Batman gets a call from the woman he's been seeing, Jaina Hudson, and puts on his Bruce Wayne voice, lying to her about why he can't make their date tonight. All of this combined unnerves Dick, and when Bruce hangs up, Batman asks why he looks so pale. Suddenly, a loud clock alarm starts ringing. Across the rooftop is a scantily clad woman holding a pocket watch, the White Rabbit. She waves to the dynamic duo and shouts, You're late! You're late! before she starts to run. The player chooses which character to pursue her as. Along the way, Robin asks Batman where all these women get their costumes. Batman responds, The same place we got your yellow cape. Har har. White Rabbit leads the player to an abandoned industrial facility. It's obviously a trap, but Batman leads the way in. 
Once inside, they find the entranceway rigged with monitors. White Rabbit slips into an area sectioned off by bars so she can escape easily, as a livid calendar man blasts onto the screens. The conversation is tense. Batman takes lead as calendar man questions him. He wants to know what Batman thinks of the crime committed last night. Batman senses the opportunity to push Calendar Man's buttons, hoping he may slip up in his anger. So he tells him any successful murder catches his eye. Calendar Man retorts that it was a barbaric display with no originality. Batman ignores the comment, turning to tell Robin that this is the Calendar Man. He's from a little before Robin's time. Calendar Man snaps that he's an artist who everyone will know. He's furious that someone stole his thunder with an early Valentine's-themed crime and demands to know who the copycat is. Batman remains silent. Fine, Calendar Man shouts. I'll find out myself. I'm quite glad about this all, actually. It's good to be challenged. It has inspired me to go further than ever before. To make up for the lackluster piece last night, he's arranged an early or belated birthday present for Batman. Two hostages in birthday-themed death traps pop up on screen. One for good luck, Calendar Man adds, before vanishing. Batman and Robin have to fight their way through the facility, taking on a number of hired thugs and solving puzzles to save each hostage. Each one of them gives the dynamic duo a birthday card filled with names. Robin points out the villains leaving clues thing again, and asks if every supervillain is so egotistical. Batman tells him that he'd be surprised. After this, the characters can go out on patrol in the open world again. You can choose which character you want to play as, and switch between them whenever you'd like. You can even have the characters stick together, traveling through the world and taking out criminals as a team, like a natural evolution of the gameplay feature in Arkham Knight. The player triggers the next mission whenever they return to the Batcave. Alfred has analyzed all the names on the birthday cards, and states that most are confirmed victims of the Calendar Man. Likely, the others are as well, they've just never been directly connected to him. Batman notes that Calendar Man is trying to solidify his infamy, just then, Oracle dials in, following up on the Warden, Valdis, and Falcone connection. She apologizes that she's late, she had a lot of homework to do. Alfred and Dick share a look, but Dick promises he finished all his. Oracle says she couldn't find a connection between Warden, Valdis, and Falcone, but she did find a connection between Falcone and the Arkham family. Falcone has some business dealings with Jeremiah Arkham, the former Warden of the Asylum, before it was shut down 20 years ago. Now, he is living in Metropolis. By this point, everyone has concluded that the Calendar Man case has nothing to do with the Falcone Arkham case, except whoever killed Warden Valdis clearly upset Calendar Man. But more relevant to the case, the murderer, or murderers, the lovers, as Alfred is taken to calling them, were sending an overt message to Batman, and likely wanted him to make this connection to Jeremiah Arkham. Bruce concludes that Calendar Man can wait since they still have some time until Valentine's Day, but with a gang war brewing in Gotham, they need to find out more before things get too volatile. Alfred and Dick ask Bruce what he wants to do, who reluctantly tells them he'll need to call the airport to get his private jet ready. He's going to Metropolis. Alfred suggests that he use this opportunity to take Janine Hudson on a date, he owes her for his recent string of cancellations. Bruce reluctantly agrees, telling him he already has a plan to use Bruce Wayne's access. Alfred scoffs. Speaking about ourselves in the third person now, are we? Batman continues that in the meantime, Robin has permission to patrol Gotham, but he needs to steer clear of Falcone and Calendar Man. Dick excitedly accepts the terms, finally feeling like he's been given real responsibility. Batman arrives in Metropolis. Yep, we're taking the bat out of Gotham, just for a bit. So we're all on the same page, this Metropolis setting will be completely open, but it will only be a section of the city, much like how Arkham City and Origins were only sections of Gotham. This will give the player the Metropolis feeling they didn't know they wanted, without forcing a second map as in-depth as the main Gotham map, which I guess I actually haven't talked about. I'm fine with an expanded map from Origins, add a third island, maybe even a fourth, just enough new but built alongside the old. Part of the reason I feel a Metropolis setting is worth exploring in this game is to avoid the samey problem of just playing in Gotham over and over again. Trust me, I love it, but now feels like the right time to mix things up. Plus, this is all fake, so I can do whatever the hell I want, no budget to underestimate or worry about. Things kick off at sundown. 
Batman needs to break into the WGBS News Headquarters, the main operations hub of billionaire Morgan Edge's corporate empire. He's doing this in order to mumbo jumbo some tech stuff. Essentially, hacking into the main security system here will allow Batman to use his cryptographic sequencer on all of Edge's security throughout Metropolis. He's doing this, as we find out through exposition with Alfred, because the connection Oracle found between Falcone and Jeremiah Arkham was a charitable donation made by Falcone to a mental health charity where Arkham sits on the board. Morgan Edge is the head of the charity, which is hosting an event tonight. Although there isn't much information on Jeremiah Arkham since he left Gotham, Edge is a known associate with great resources. If anyone can point Batman to Arkham, it would be Edge. But really, this first mission is a small one just to ease the player into this new setting before opening up the game to free roam. The level plays out with the player sneaking into the news headquarters, and it's more of a puzzle type level than it is combat or stealth. As Batman gets deeper into the headquarters, there's automated lethal security systems which show how important this area is for Edge and what he's willing to do to protect it. The goal is to get through this level without raising any alarms, so while there are guards, Batman avoids them eventually getting to the computer terminal he was looking for. He checks to see if Edge has any data on Arkham, but he has absolutely nothing. Suspicious. Batman syncs up his sequencer, allowing him to leave the facility much easier than he arrived. This will come in handy for the upcoming charity event hosted by Edge that Bruce Wayne is attending tonight with Janine Hudson. So before heading to that event, the player is free reign to explore Metropolis, pick up some side activities, and take in a completely new utopian setting. When the time comes, Batman returns to his hotel room. A cinematic starts with Bruce Wayne fully decked out in his finest attire, arriving at the door of Jane Hudson, a Gotham socialite with a hobby for charity, adorned in a sleek, expensive gown, complete with showy jewelry. Bruce tells her she looks beautiful, she tells him the same, and he takes her hand. Jump to the interior of a limousine. The player now has control over Bruce Wayne, to the right sits Jane, and through the darkened windows of the car, there's an innumerable storm of flashing lights. God, I hope that one from the Daily Planet isn't here. Such a pain in the ass, Jane sighs, then turns to Bruce. Smile, dear. You're on camera. She opens the door and steps out onto a red carpet, with a sea of paparazzi on either side. The player walks through this scene. Think of the opening from Arkham City with Bruce walking through the detainment center. There's plenty of little character details the player can discover if they take the time, or they can walk straight through into the charity, paying no one any mind. I think it would be fun to have Jane putting on a little bit of an act for the camera throughout. As Bruce steps onto the carpet, everyone is shouting to get his attention. He can stop to have a quick one sentence back and forth with a couple of paparazzi, he can pose in front of the backdrop for pictures with Jane, he can take a glass of champagne off a server's tray once inside the event. You know, fancy rich guy stuff. Once inside, the player can peruse the event, but once they reunite with Jane, a cinematic triggers. Lois Lane pushes through the crowd, making a beeline straight for Bruce Wayne, with dopey reporter Clark Kent on her heels. Lois levies a barrage of hard-hitting questions at Bruce, running the gambit from why he's taken a more hands-on approach with Wayne Enterprises, his shuffling of leadership positions, and where he disappeared to for years, but is slowed down by Jane, stepping between them. Saying she's getting jealous, no questions have come her way. Clark apologizes over Lois' shoulder, and says that when someone as popular as Mr. Wayne arrives in Metropolis, the Daily Planet likes to take advantage of the opportunity. Lois ignores Clark and Jane, deciding to keep her next question simple. Why are you here tonight, Mr. Wayne? To which Bruce responds that he wanted to take the lovely Miss Hudson out on a date. Lois smirks. A charity event for millionaires is a simple date night for Gotham's notorious playboy. Boring. Smallville, follow me. Jimmy had better found a good angle on the lectern by now. Clark awkwardly smiles at Bruce and Jane and says, I hope you have a lovely evening in Metropolis before chasing after Lois. Bruce and Jane both sigh, happy to be left alone. Just in time for Morgan Edge to make his appearance at the lectern, which is positioned atop a large, double-sided marble staircase, appropriately above everyone else. Edge thanks them all for coming to support a cause that's near and dear to him. He also thanks the members of the board who make all their important work possible. Bruce notes that while some members of the board are here, Jeremiah is not. With a cheers, Edge tells everyone it's time to move into the dining hall, where dinner will be served. In the commotion, Bruce tells Jane that he's not feeling very well. 
he's gonna find a private bathroom where he won't have to worry about a reporter writing an expose on the color of his underwear. Jane tells him to feel better and hurry back. Using the chaos of the crowd, Bruce slips behind the scenes and continues his investigation. This is a stealth sequence played as Bruce Wayne, making his way beyond security thanks to a small hacking device disguised as his watch. This short section ends when Bruce arrives at Morgan Edge's private office, and of course, he's able to find a secret back room accessible via the sequencer. Once inside, he connects directly with Edge's personal devices, granting him access to text, email, and phone records. He searches for any reference to Jeremiah Arkham, and discovers an encrypted conversation with Bruno Mannheim an old-school Metropolis gangster who fell off the radar a number of years ago. The conversation references shipments for Arkham. In fact, one is going down at the docks tonight. Before Bruce can get any information, none other than Morgan Edge himself comes into the main office. Unable to find a way out of the secret room, Bruce distracts Edge by calling him as himself. Morgan, buddy, I've been wanting to talk to you. Where did you disappear to? Who is this? It's Bruce! Listen, I've got a great proposal for you. Trust me, no spreadsheets involved. Bruce Wayne? I didn't know you had my number. I have everyone's number, Morgan. I'm just outside the ballroom, and I'm really impressed with the event tonight. I'd like to chat about what more I can do to help. Over a couple of drinks. How's that sound? I'd be happy to. It's long overdue two men like us had a chat. I'll be right down. Bruce muffles himself on the phone. Oh yes. Two old fashions. Terrific! I'll see you soon, buddy. Edge hangs up and adjusts his suit. Fantastic. I get to milk that oaf Wayne for all he's worth. Tonight couldn't get much better. With Edge gone, Bruce makes a quick escape out of the room and takes an emergency exit that he deactivated the alarm for out onto the streets. He finds the bat cycle and grabs his equipment off of it, getting changed back into the bat suit ready to make his move to the docks. Along the way, he alerts Jane that he's feeling far worse than he thought, so he'll be leaving early, but she should stay, and they'll catch up later. Soon after, he gets a call from an irritated Edge, but Bruce gives him the same story. I also want to note that from this point forward, eagle-eyed players will be able to occasionally spot White Rabbit on rooftops following Batman throughout the rest of the game. She's fast, so even if you do spot her and try to chase her, she'll always get away. However, if you spot her at a distance, she'll give you a wave or blow you a kiss. Also, nice try with the remote-controlled Batarang, but she'll dodge it. I promise this is going to be relevant at some point. When Batman arrives at the docks, he remarks to himself that Metropolis has the same problems as Gotham if you look hard enough. This section of the docks is overrun by a gang that he doesn't recognize. They're lugging massive crates off of a large ship and packing them into trucks for transport. It's unclear what's in the crates, but based on gang dialogue and caution, it's clear it's highly valuable and extremely dangerous to handle. That's all Batman needs to hear to break up this operation. His main goal is to find the shipment for Arkham and track down where it's heading, but he knows from Edge's texts that Bruno Mannheim is heading things up, and it doesn't take long for Batman to spot the mafioso brute shouting orders to his men. He'll beat Arkham's location out of Mannheim and learn more about this operation in the process. So Batman goes through this entire dock level, stealthily taking out goons left and right. You know the drill. I think it could be fun to have the player messing with their equipment, sabotaging forklifts, cranes, whatever. It's not necessary, but could help create some chaos to better execute stealth situations. Once Batman clears out goons around a crate, he tries to investigate the contents, but is unable to access them due to an unusual digital lock that he cannot break. This triggers an alarm, the gang now knows the player is here, and all the guards go on full alert. Unable to crack the weapon system, Batman decides to plant trackers on all the weapons containers so he can find them later. Since it's clear something is awry, Bruno emerges from his observation deck and demands his men pick up the good stuff. He thinks that the Boy Scout discovered them, but these weapons should hurt even him. From a vantage point, Batman realizes that Bruno is handing out the same kind of laser guns that Falcone's men used. This makes the stealth scenario especially dangerous if Batman gets caught. Once everyone is cleared out, this just leaves Bruno, who Batman interrogates for information. He's uncooperative, surprised to see Batman, but relieved he isn't dealing with a metahuman. Batman thrashes Bruno to prove he doesn't need powers to humble a washed up gangster. Unwilling to discuss any of the details of the shipments or weapons, Batman only gets information on where they deliver to Jeremiah Arkham. 
He leaves Bruno strung up for the Metropolis police to find and heads out. At this point, it's up to the player if they want to explore more of Metropolis during free roam or head straight to the next mission. The player arrives at an abandoned LexCorp facility, recently purchased by Morgan Edge within the last year, that is yet to be renovated. Security is surprisingly lax, and Batman feels he's hit a dead end. However, he decides to break into the facility and look around for any leads. Inside, he finds that the old lab has largely been gutted. He doesn't see any signs of recent deliveries, and wonders if Bruno lied to him. Walking deeper inside, Batman discovers a recently occupied office. There isn't much, but it's clear someone has been here often. A photograph of Jeremiah's daughter, Amity, sits on the desk beside a computer that contains practically no information. Using his detective vision, Batman notices a switch beneath the photograph of Amity Arkham, when he presses it, it unlocks his secret compartment in the corner of the office, uncovering a hole with a ladder that goes down too far to see. Naturally, Batman jumps down that hole, finding himself in an enormous underground facility. He remains in the shadows and takes in his immediate surroundings. There are guards everywhere. Security is tight, and there is a checkpoint right away. His communication with the Batcave has been cut off. However, nobody knows that he's here yet, and he's able to take out the guards at the checkpoint without raising any alarms. Now, he has access to an array of security cameras which show him something truly disturbing. Jeremiah Arkham is running a top secret asylum to treat the criminally insane through inhuman experimentation. Batman sees cell after cell of prisoners in straitjackets barely clinging on to their minds after God knows how much treatment and torture. While downloading the schematics of the facility and learning as much as he can about the operation, Batman spots Jeremiah on one of the cameras. He is pushing a cart through a hallway with a hulking brute of a man at his back, Amygdala, and arrives in a small lab with a gas chamber in the center. A young man who refuses to answer to his real name and only responds to the name Abattoir stands in the chamber, pounding desperately against the glass. Jeremiah pleads for Abattoir to remain calm, that he's getting closer to curing him of his ailment, his insatiable desire to kill. Abattoir demands freedom, but Jeremiah looks on him saddened and sympathetic telling him that it's his life's work to make sure he and others like him get that freedom. He takes a number of vials from his cart and inserts them into the chamber, filling it with a pink-green mist. Abattoir seizes as if he's being electrocuted, and then suddenly collapses forward, his face pressed against the glass. Jeremiah turns to Amygdala and asks him to carry Abattoir to the observation room. As they leave the lab, Jeremiah notes that he'd love to keep a pillow in the gas chamber if only the inmates wouldn't use it as a weapon. Back in the security checkpoint, Batman is baffled. This is a far worse development than he could have imagined, but he still doesn't understand how Jeremiah connects to Falcone. So, Batman begins making his way through this secret asylum, and this will be a pretty meaty level that frankly will exhaust me to get into too much detail on. Imagine a sort of homage to the Arkham Asylum game, bringing back the creepy and unsettling atmosphere, but in a more sterilized and somehow even less moral, scientific setting. For scale, I'm thinking something about 150% the size of the penitentiary building from Arkham Asylum. There will be plenty of hallways, enemy encounters, stealth opportunities, and easter eggs to discover as the player makes their way through this facility. Since this is owned by Morgan Edge, Batman already has tech to get through some security, and there will be plenty of well-equipped guards to take down. Ultimately, Batman's goal is to get to Jeremiah, and there are a number of roadblocks along the way that force him to take alternative routes. And once the jig is up and Jeremiah knows Batman is here, things only get more difficult. In classic Arkham game fashion, Jeremiah begins talking with Batman over the intercom telling him that they're kindred spirits out for the betterment of society. Batman inspired him. He is the logical next step in Batman's crusade. The Dark Knight captures the criminals, but someone needs to cure them or the cycle will never end. Jeremiah sees himself as chosen. It is his destiny to be the liberator of mankind, to free the soul from the corruption of madness. He claims to view the inmates as his children, but as the player makes their way through the facility, they uncover more grotesque experiments on these illegally held inmates, 
and Batman grows angrier and angrier. Some of these people are criminals he'd been pursuing but failed to capture in time. He begins to blame himself for not being quick enough. I think this could be a great place to introduce the lunatics from Arkham Asylum. Rather than just having them be straight up cartoonishly crazy loons, they could be the result of Jeremiah's failed experiments, cementing their fate at eventually being transferred to Arkham Asylum as the cruelest of ironies. One such criminal suffering from Jeremiah's experiments is Abattoir, who Batman discovers in the observation room. However, when Batman goes to check on him, Abattoir shoots up and begins attacking in a vicious state seemingly against his will. During this mini-boss fight, where Abattoir is joined by a number of other lunatics, it's revealed that Jeremiah has developed a form of mind control. He laments that he's only able to take away their pain for a short time, but it does come in handy. Batman defeats these victims, and his rage increases. He continues to fight toward Jeremiah's position, which is a secure lab on the lowest level of the facility. So, while the player's going through this entire level, there will of course be long monologues from Jeremiah over the intercom. How I'm presenting it now will seem like the heaviest of exposition dumps, but just imagine getting this info throughout the entire mission. Firstly, Jeremiah tells Batman that he wasn't able to help Amygdala during his time as Warden of Arkham Asylum. However, thanks to his continued research, Amygdala, who can be seen obediently at Jeremiah's side throughout, and with the occasional intercom comment, is like Jeremiah's first son. Jeremiah also constantly brings up his daughter Amity, who he had a falling out with. Amity was practically raised in the old asylum. She saw terrible things, and after it was shut down, her general fear that the asylum and Gotham at large were cursed was the driving force behind the Arkham family's decision to move to Metropolis. However, years later, after Jeremiah's wife committed suicide, Amity left him behind. It becomes clear that Jeremiah's obsession with being seen as a successful father figure stems from his failure with Amity. He was never able to give her the love she needed. That was her mother's specialty. Jeremiah harbors complicated feelings for his daughter, anger and grief, and repeatedly says that maybe with his experiments, he can finally make anyone feel loved. Once the player arrives at the final lab, Jeremiah is unable to run and pleads with Batman asking him what he would do in his position if his own children were sick and needed treatment. Batman refutes him, saying he's the sick one here. Jeremiah hoped Batman would understand, but injects a complacent amygdala with a syringe, removing the cure he constantly keeps flowing through his son's veins, revealing to Batman the true nature of the monsters people can be without Jeremiah's help. Amygdala is this brutish, absolutely intimidating opponent who towers over Batman, similarly to Bane from Arkham Asylum. I think his speed should surprise Batman, and before the boss fight actually gets started, he manages to lunge forward and crack his fist against Batman's forearm, severely damaging it. For the actual boss fight, I'm not exactly sure how this would go. But unlike the Asylum Bane fight, Amygdala needs to be fast and fierce constantly on Batman's tail until he can temporarily be stopped by either environmental interaction or specific gadgets. In those openings, Batman is able to do damage. Once all that's said and done, Batman is alone with Jeremiah, who cowers on the floor. Terrified of the Batman before him, he's slipping into a psychotic episode of his own. Batman interrogates him, demanding to know what happened to Warden Valdis. Jeremiah becomes enraged at the name, calling him a brute with no scientific mind. He doesn't know anything about his murder, but he's happy to hear that he's dead. Batman demands to know Jeremiah's connection to Falcone. He explains that the Arkhams and the Falcones are old families in Gotham. He met Carmine when they were young, but that's it. Batman shouts that he's lying. He brings up the donation to the charity. Jeremiah whimpers. Long story short, Jeremiah acted as a middleman for the high-tech weapons deal between Falcone and Edge. Batman asks what Edge's plan is, and Jeremiah admits that he doesn't know. He just knows that Edge is like them. He's genuinely working for the betterment of humanity. That lug Bruno Mannheim and his intergang are simply a means to an end for Edge. Batman snatches away a remote that has been with Jeremiah this whole time, a device he's been bragging about connected to the source of his latest breakthrough. Without knowing what it is, Batman shatters it in his hand. Rage clear on his face, Jeremiah 
disgusts him. The Twisted Warden pleads, but it's too late. The entire facility begins shaking. Within an instant, plants shoot through the walls and engulf Jeremiah. Poison Ivy emerges, covered in tubes and wires. She looks wilted and emaciated. Jeremiah quickly looks to Batman and says, please take care of my children. Batman tries to free Jeremiah from the foliage, but it's too late. He is executed by Poison Ivy. Batman turns to Ivy, the two meeting for the first time, but they are left without words. He recognizes that Ivy has been horribly abused. She's weak and desperate. In his moment of sympathetic hesitation, Ivy uses all her strength to summon a wave of plant life that burrows a hole straight up to the surface. She escapes into the night. Demoralized, unsatisfied, and angry, Batman doesn't know what else to do other than continue the investigation. Thanks to the large hole, he can exit back up to Metropolis rather easily. With his connection to the Batcave operational again, he calls Alfred and tells him to alert Metropolis PD about an emergency and to bring as many paramedics as they can spare. There's been a horrible injustice done. Before heading to the last main mission in Metropolis, the player is able to free roam around the city once again, but they won't be able to return to Metropolis until after the main story is completed. Batman activates the trackers that he placed on all the intergang weapon containers and finds that the majority of them have moved and are at the same location, leading him right to one of their major hideouts. When he arrives, he catches Alfred up to speed on his conversation with Jeremiah Arkham and states that his goal is to stop the import of dangerous weapons from getting into Falcone's hands, but also into Gotham at large. If these weapons made their way into the city in mass, it would create an arms race that would spiral out of control. It's also important to note that by this point, Batman has become fatigued from the night. Physically, but more importantly, mentally, and his arm is giving him trouble after his fight with Amygdala. The intergang hideout is a fortress. This isn't the random dock Batman caught them off guard at. They are armed to the teeth and ready for the player. Intergang is using some insanely out of this world technology, the origins of which Batman cannot comprehend. So there's practically no way he can sneak inside. I think it's a fun idea to take the typical Batman scenario and completely flip it on its head. For once, he's charging straight through the front door and the opponents can take you down in two shots. Or a max of four shots if you've already maxed out your armor by this point. Since this is a significant change to standard gameplay, there will be plenty of opportunities for the player to hide and strategize next steps. But ultimately, the guards in this level are much more lethal and alert compared to what Batman is typically up against. They've taken long-term stealth off the table and forced him into an open siege on the intergang hideout. But Batman is up to the task. His goal is to clear out a number of different chambers housing the weapon containers so that he can destroy each of them. Each chamber is a different kind of challenge map situation a mix between combat and stealth with these inter-gangsters. Once four of those chambers are completed, destroying four weapon containers, Batman comes looking for the last six, which leads him to a chamber housing an insanely huge vault. It's thick and sealed by some crazy advanced technology Batman cannot figure out how to break. He wonders to himself if he should just use the signal he has on his belt. The player is left wondering, what that means. Just then, a giant mech suit comes charging into the chamber. It's Bruno Mannheim, sporting a lovely neck brace from his last run-in with Batman. Bruno brags about being the first one to field test this armor. Batman damns Bruno and prepares to take him on. Just then, Bruno kicks up some concrete at Batman. He tries to dodge, but has to block with his injured forearm, and a crack echoes across the chamber. His arm is broken and Bruno begins laughing. The boss fight commences. Since this chamber is so massive, it's got a lot of spots for Batman to hide. But the locations are tight, so he can't move too far while hiding. However, every once in a while, Bruno will begin kicking, throwing, somehow launching pieces of concrete ripped up from the floor beneath him. These will fly at Batman, and if he isn't in cover by the time they come, he'll get hit and die. Think of a twist on the Scarecrow fear hallucinations from Arkham Asylum. Every once in a while, Bruno will get close and try looking for Batman or shaking the structures around him, and if he sees the player, they are screwed, but really, he's at his worst from a distance. The player is trying to rework the electrical grid in the chamber to interfere with the functioning of Bruno's suit. Since as he's kicking up the concrete, 
He's exposing insanely powerful wires beneath him, wires strong enough to power that enormous vault. The player has to solve puzzles on how to manipulate the electricity three different times. And each time they're successful, Bruno collapses near enough to Batman that the player can bash his mech suit, weakening him until he's finally immobilized. Batman then uses his explosive gel to blow the front off the mech armor, then drags Bruno out with one arm and slams him against the vault terminal. The combination now. There's no getting through and I ain't talking. You don't get to win in this city, Batman. Fine. I'll do it your way. Batman pulls a switch out from his utility belt and presses a red button. Nothing happens. Bruno chuckles to himself, coughing up a little blood. The wall behind them bursts open, a red and blue blur zips through, the vault door is torn down as a sonic boom echoes across the chamber. Bruno looks on in stunned silence before Batman knocks him unconscious. I was wondering if you'd call. Superman descends toward the ground holding all six weapon containers on his shoulders. These are the ones you were looking for, right? Batman nods and Superman destroys them with his heat vision. That really needs to be looked at. It sounded painful. I've had worse. Batman holds onto his arm and begins to walk away. Oh, I know, I've seen your x-rays, Superman says. I'll take you to a doctor, someone I trust, discreet and understanding. Why would you know a doctor? Batman scoffs, stepping inside the vault. He's a friend I mostly introduced to other friends. Superman smiles. I lost you when you went underground, but I got the full picture when the medical staff began arriving. Thank you for taking care of that so quickly. It was nothing I couldn't handle, Batman remarks. This is all alien technology. You've got quite the problem brewing in Metropolis. Thanks to you, I know where to start rooting out the problem. I've been suspicious of Edge for some time. You have too many crazy billionaires in this city. Good thing you're heading off tomorrow. Superman smiles again. Tonight, Batman retorts. I've only stopped Gotham's problems from getting worse. They're still volatile. You need rest, Superman insists. Unless you want lasting damage, you need to get that arm treated. Please, let me take you to my friend. And isn't there a lovely socialite waiting for you? Why not have one good night's rest? I promise. I won't let anything horrible happen in the meantime. You can't be everywhere at once, Batman grimaces, exiting the vault. Neither can you, Bruce. Superman offers out his hand. Batman sighs, acquiescing to Superman's good nature. Is there another way we can do this? I've gotta hold you somehow. Fine, I'll just tell Jane an eager reporter got too physical with me. Batman takes Superman's hand, and the pair fly off in a blur. That ends the Metropolis portion of this Batman video game. I hope you enjoyed your stay. We cut back to Robin, patrolling Gotham alone for the first time with Batman absent from the city. He has strict orders not to pursue anything in relation to Calendar Man or Falcone, but he's okay with that. Despite all the restrictions, he feels he's finally earned some trust. He gets a call from Alfred that there has been a disturbance reported near Gotham's Museum of Modern Art. Robin can make his way over there whenever he wants, but in the meantime, it's Free Roam City. Get reacquainted with Gotham, player. When Robin begins the investigation, he finds a statue out front that has been replaced with an abstract-looking, giant green question mark. Robin remarks there's only one guy in Batman's files that could be behind this. The front of the museum has also been painted, and it's only by standing at the exact right spot on an adjacent rooftop that Robin is able to piece together what it says. Of course, it's a riddle. It reads, What do bullets do to bat wings? Riddles them, Robin says under his breath. He's eager to pursue a supervillain, but knows he'll be deterred. When Alfred calls to check on him, Robin says that it's just a case of graffiti, nothing major to report. Alfred insists that Robin should go and find the vandal if he can. No need for violence, but sometimes a strong talking to works better. Robin yeses him to death, and when Alfred hangs up, he sneaks inside the museum, which has been overrun with green-clad goons. The museum is closed, and the few staff held hostage are locked inside a janitor's closet. Not in immediate harm. No one knows Robin has entered, and as he assesses the situation, he is nervous and excited, noting that none of the goons even appear to be armed. He smiles, joking to himself that Riddler has made this too easy for him. The second Robin drops down onto the floor, a green alarm triggers, alerting nearby goons to his location. Robin shrugs, saying there goes the element of surprise. After taking down the goons, the Riddler emerges on a tiny old-school TV, 
beginning to taunt the Batman. Robin figures out pretty quickly that this Riddler message has been pre-recorded, and even ejects the cassette from the VCR halfway through his spiel after getting the gist. Riddler set up a series of tests for Batman. He has hacked security doors throughout the museum, locking in his goons with certain pieces of art that will be destroyed if Batman doesn't answer the riddle for each room in time. Certain that solving riddles isn't his strong suit, Robin considers alerting Alfred or calling Batman for help, but another plan comes to mind. Making his way to the nearest sealed off area, while maneuvering through security obstacles Riddler and his goons set up, Robin calls Oracle to see if she can hack the security doors to deactivate them, but after giving it a shot, she concludes that it would take her far too long to get through Riddler's security. Robin begins to panic that if he doesn't solve these riddles, priceless art is going to be destroyed. He already lied to Alfred, and now he has to call Batman for help. Eager to prove herself as well, Oracle stops Robin and asks, well, what's the first riddle anyway? Robin gets into a position so that the riddle is clear, which triggers an audible timer. He panics some more and reads it to her. Taking only a moment, Oracle provides an answer. Robin, unsure what to do, just says the answer out loud, which automatically lifts the security door. Robin and Oracle freak out excitedly as Robin charges forward to fight the first set of goons, who are disappointed they didn't get to destroy any fancy art. This pattern repeats for three more rounds, and the player actually has to solve the riddles based on a three-choice selection, Although, in-universe, it is Oracle coming up with the answers for Robin to repeat. I wish I was smart enough to come up with good riddle examples for you all, but I just embarrass myself even more than I currently am. This bonding experience continues until they come to the final security door. When that riddle is solved, the door opens to reveal a massive hole in the back wall. Confused, Robin investigates. He steps through as Oracle tells him that the neighboring building is a Belayan embassy. It turns out, Riddler used all the commotion in the museum and his subsequent riddles to distract and slow down Batman while he burrowed next door to steal a prized jewel. Riddler has completely taken over the embassy. His men here are armed to the teeth, and there are hostages everywhere. When Oracle understands the situation, she tells Robin that he should call Batman right away, but Robin insists that this is what he's been training for. While the Riddler is distracted upstairs, breaking the safe where the jewel is stored after being delayed by some of the embassy occupants, Robin begins silently taking out all his goons and rescuing the hostages. It's critical that Robin remains unseen in this scenario, but once Riddler realizes what's going on, he assumes it's Batman who has finally arrived to stop him. He begins to taunt Batman, telling him that he's too late. He's moments away from getting what he came for, and then his escape cannot be stopped. Once the stealth gameplay is completed, Robin finally confronts the Riddler, who is in some short, dopey-looking drill mech, but has just acquired the jewel. He's stunned, questioning where Batman is. Robin tells him that he's out of town for the night, and Riddler becomes livid, saying there's no way this brat could have solved his riddles without help. Robin prods him saying that they were actually pretty easy. Riddler freaks out, allowing his ego to get in the way of his supposedly flawless escape plan, and he tries to kill Robin. This is a pretty pathetic boss encounter, where Robin is easily able to one-shot the Riddler simply by vaulting up above him and giving his noggin a good crack. Robin jokes that next time, Riddler should invest in a helmet. Suddenly, the embassy is swarmed by Belayan soldiers, and Robin quickly finds cover. As he sneaks out of the embassy, Oracle congratulates him on defeating Riddler, and teases him about his claim that he solved the riddles himself. Robin apologizes, but Oracle understands why he took credit. It was the smart move to stop Riddler from escaping. Robin makes his way back to the museum to free the hostages, but is suddenly challenged by a young ninja before he can do so. This is Robin's Deathstroke fight, where Robin is battling against a near equal in terms of combat ability and resources. He is narrowly able to win the fight, knocking off the ninja's hood to reveal a childhood friend from the circus, Boon. Now going by the name Shrike, he is called off by his Belayan superiors, 
who state that the GCPD will handle things outside the embassy. The storyline between these two will pick up in an optional side mission that I will get into if I ever make a side missions video. So Robin frees the hostages, who thank him profusely, which makes him feel like he did a good job. After leaving the museum, Robin is in full free roam mode once again. After a little bit, Oracle asks Robin to fix some satellites around the city to help strengthen her connection. This is a task that needs to be completed before moving on to the next side mission, but can be handled in no particular order while free roaming. Once all satellites are handled, Oracle calls Robin again to help her with the last one. When Robin arrives at the location, Oracle steps out onto the rooftop. The two meet each other for the first time, and they're both a little tongue-tied, but ecstatic to finally see each other in person. While neither knows the other's identity, they excitedly reflect on taking down the Riddler together. Oracle examines Robin's suit, up close and personal. Robin comments that he didn't imagine Oracle as a redhead, but he likes her look. Oracle teases him. My look? Faced with no good answer and a teenaged awkwardness, Robin simply smiles and half nods. A flame shoots into the sky on the far end of Gotham. The pair glance at each other, then Robin jumps from the rooftop, soaring toward the riverfront, where he finds that a major port has caught on fire in some accident. The fire department is already there, taking care of those who were injured. Oracle gets back on comms with Robin and tells him this wasn't just an accident, there's serious GCPD chatter about criminal activity. From the rooftops, Robin spots Captain Gordon and positions himself above him. He whistles, just as Harvey Bullock walks over. Gordon sees Robin, but doesn't acknowledge him, instead letting Bullock fill him in. Whoever broke in was likely looking for a specific chemical found in the two different canisters that exploded offshore. The geniuses sprung a leak before taking to sea, and likely the explosion was a result of mishandled stolen goods. Gordon repeats the condensed version and proper next steps loudly enough for Robin to hear. Robin then leaves the scene and asks Oracle if she caught all that. She complains that the entire waterfront probably heard it, sounding a bit embarrassed. Knowing that the criminals are still out there, Robin asks if there's another location nearby that could have a large enough supply of the same type of chemicals. Oracle discovers that there is one other place. It is less than half the amount of this warehouse, but far more than anywhere else in the area. A local toy factory. When Robin arrives, he discovers a number of boats anchored just off the river and spots two snipers on either side of the factory roof, with a number of thugs patrolling the outside. Confident he can take out a couple of robbers on his own, Robin decides to leap into action. He asks Oracle if there's a way she could get in touch with Gordon directly to let him know what's going on. She hesitates, but says to leave it to her. The player takes out all the enemies outside the factory and then proceeds inside. However, as Robin steps through the door, he trips a wire and is doused with gas. He coughs, asking why everyone keeps trying to suffocate him, then slowly recognizes that he stepped into a nightmare. The toy factory has become distorted in a fear hallucination as Oracle's voice slowly fades away. This fear hallucination should accomplish for Robin what they accomplished for Batman in Arkham Asylum, a surreal peek into his psyche. There will of course be some visualization of his parents' murder, maybe a quick glimpse at Tony Zuko for the diehards, but there will also be a strong focus on Batman. Through his visions, it becomes clear that Robin harbors some fear of Batman and of becoming just like him. As the player proceeds across the level, it never goes into a complete alternate reality like the levels from Asylum. Instead, as the hallucination gets stronger, the environment and the thug designs change over time. First, it's just generic creepy stuff, maybe playing around with the toy theme, then it's circus themed with Robin facing off against zombified versions of people he knew. And finally, it transitions to a bat theme. All the thugs eventually look like horror versions of Batman. The environment is tinged with cave-like elements and darkness. At one point, the crime scene Robin went to meet Bruce at is recreated in the background. Throughout the entire level, some thugs will be saying, you're not good enough, you're not strong enough, and variations on that. The frequency of which only increases as the level continues, until by the end, as Robin is facing down hordes of horrifying Batmen, each of them is chanting it at Robin. As he beats the last Batman, he can't stop hitting him, until his fist reveals his own face under the Batman's mask. Robin stumbles back in terror, as the voice of Oracle finally reaches him in his hallucination. They both know about Scarecrow, and Oracle manages to calm Robin down, 
bringing him back to his senses. For now, the world goes back to reality. Behind him, Robin sees a trail of unconscious goons, all wearing freshly cracked gas masks. Robin tries to tell Oracle what he saw, but there's too much to say. Oracle tells Robin that he's done a great job, the police are on the way, and he can fall back. Robin refuses. He needs to see this to the end. As he sneaks deeper into the toy factory, there's a final stealth room he needs to clear. Scarecrow is closed off preparing the chemical containers for transport. As this room plays out, we get some exposition through thug dialogue about their heist. Scarecrow and his men weren't originally planning to make a move on the chemicals tonight, but when word came that Batman was sighted in Metropolis, they decided their safest bet was to move their operation up. Unfortunately for them, they weren't 100% prepared, which is why the accident unfolded at the prior location. This also explains why Robin experiences the unlikely event of two major supervillain schemes on the one night Batman isn't in town. Once the room is cleared out by the player, gas floods out from behind the door where Scarecrow is. Unable to resist it, the world begins to alter around Robin once again. Scarecrow emerges as this big, hulking force, a horror monster here to kill Robin. If you've ever played Injustice 2, picture how Scarecrow appears in that game. This is the first time Robin has seen Scarecrow in person, and with everything else going on, he's terrified. But still, he pushes through his fear. Scarecrow should be taunting Robin, telling him that he's heard about him. That Batman shouldn't have left a scared little boy all alone in the dark. As the fighting progresses, the taunts just get worse and worse, with Scarecrow constantly comparing Robin to Batman, using that to fuel his fear. To be honest, I have no idea how this Scarecrow boss fight should go, but in my mind, it's much more akin to Scarecrow's Injustice 2 style of combat than the Arkham Asylum massive vision hallucination levels. That could canonically be explained away by saying that Scarecrow's fear toxin is much different now than it becomes later. So Robin has to physically battle Scarecrow, and I think a lot of fun mind tricks and hallucinations can come into effect in the combat to explain why Robin has a difficult time. However, he eventually overcomes Scarecrow, who shrivels into his true form, a wimpy doctor in a silly outfit. Then, Robin is suddenly swarmed by monsters who storm onto the scene. Still affected by the toxin, he lashes out in frightened anger. Oracle is begging him to stop, stop, stop. Their police officers, her dad is there. Robin comes to with his elbow pinning Gordon's neck against a wall. Around his feet are several severely injured cops. Robin stumbles back and apologizes in shame. Gordon falls to the floor, gripping his neck and gasping for air. Robin calls for the Batmobile to pick him up and collapses inside. The screen goes black as the tires screech. Cut to Dick on the examination table in the Batcave. He comes to just for an instant to see Alfred with his sleeves rolled up, administering an antitoxin into Dick's arm. He notices the young man's open eyes and comforts him, saying that everything will be alright. He's home now. The muffled voice of Bruce Wayne speaks to Alfred through his earpiece. How are his vitals? He's stabilizing, Alfred says. He's going to be alright. Dick fades into unconsciousness as the conversation continues without him. Cut to the next night. Bruce sits beside an unconscious Dick with his arm in a sling. He looks worried, keeping a steady eye on his vitals. Alfred walks in with a tray of food, insisting that Bruce eat something. Bruce ignores him, blaming himself for Dick getting hurt, saying he was too busy playing billionaire when he should have been around to protect him. Alfred understands where Bruce is coming from, but pushes back on the notion Bruce was playing anything. The condition he's in, the people he saved, he deserved some rest. Bruce says that it isn't enough. He's failing to put the pieces together on this case, and he hasn't been a good mentor to Dick. He brings up Superman, how he's able to be compassionate and perfectly capable. Bruce says seeing him last night oddly brought up memories of his own father. He tells Alfred he doesn't know what he's been doing these last six months. He isn't chalked up to be any sort of father figure. Batman and Robin was a mistake from the start. He won't let Dick get hurt again. He won't bring him deeper into this life. Whenever Dick wakes up, he'll be a normal boy again, and Batman will operate alone from now on. Alfred begins to protest, but they are interrupted by a message to the Bat computer. It's the Penguin, and he has a special surprise that he knows Batman will appreciate. Bruce stands up 
and Alfred asks him what the hell he thinks he's doing. Bruce says he's going out. Alfred rejects this entirely, saying it's too dangerous with the condition he's in. He's in no shape to fight. Bruce just says, I'll push through. Alfred throws his hands up in protest. Why do I even bother? You'll never stop. And, I'm afraid, the young man on that table is more like you than either of you want to admit. Bruce dons the cowl, and from here, the player has the option to explore the Batcave until they go out into some Gotham City free roam. The next mission starts when the player decides to meet with the Penguin. Turns out, he has captured Alberto Falcone, trying to flee the city. Penguin tells Batman that he was in a car with a girl, but Penguin thought Batman wouldn't much like kidnapping an innocent woman, so in honor of their alliance, he let her go. Batman dryly congratulates Penguin, tears the duct tape from Alberto's mouth, and asks him who he was with. Alberto spits up blood, choking out that she was just some whore. Just like with the Riddler mission from earlier in the game, the player has the option of dialogue when interrogating Alberto. This isn't some random RPG dialogue just for the sake of it. You get three questions to choose from, and the conversation moves from there. If you've ever played L.A. Noir, I'm thinking a much lighter version of that game's interrogation. Is this a bit different than what is usually in an Arkham game? Absolutely. But I think introducing new mechanics makes each game unique, and I think this shows off a side of Batman these games have never really done before. Based on your specific dialogue choices, you'll get different bits of information. The story still progresses on rails, but all the unique information gathered will make sense if you pay close enough attention, so it shouldn't feel like busy work, more of an intriguing way to keep the player engaged through some story-focused progression. The gist is, Alberto ran away from home. He can't stand his father and had to get away. The reason for the secrecy is because if his father knew he was here, he never let him stay out of the family business. Alberto curses the Penguin, shouting that this crap is exactly what he was trying to escape from. Batman questions why Alberto is back in Gotham. Alberto gets shifty, says that he heard about what happened to his father. He isn't heartless. He came to check on him in the hospital. It was all a waste, though. There was more security than he anticipated guarding his old man at all hours of the day. He couldn't risk being spotted, so decided to leave town. Batman leaves Alberto and huddles up with the Penguin, who shows Batman what his men found in Alberto's car. A backpack with a laptop, torn up notebook, yesterday's issue of the Gotham Gazette, rag, Penguin coughs to himself, a few writing utensils, some paper clips, and a tube of chapstick. Oh, and a revolver. Penguin dangles the weapon by its handle. Mind if I beat him with it? Enough, Batman snaps. He stays here for now. If they risk the police knowing about Alberto, they might as well tell Falcone themselves since the department is so corrupt. Batman tells Penguin to keep Alberto well fed and to have his wounds looked at. He's to be treated as a prisoner, not tortured and abused. The Penguin cackles, giddy to see how far beyond the law Batman will go. He likes this side of him. Maybe this partnership has a future. Batman storms off. Leaving the Iceberg Lounge, Batman comes across Catwoman and the two engage in a game of cat and mouse, with Catwoman leading Batman throughout the city in a chase slash team up. Catwoman wants to roleplay as Batman tonight, leading him to amateur crime she's aware of due to her network so they can take them down together. Eventually, Batman stops Catwoman from playing this game and asks her about the other night. What did she steal? Catwoman tells him it was worthless, merely sentimental heirlooms she stole to be spiteful. Falcone had asked her for help hunting down Alberto and didn't offer her enough to do it. Batman retorts that Falcone hates freaks, and as far as he can tell, Catwoman fits the description. She laughs. You're not wrong about that. Regardless, he asked me. That's why I was there, but he's upped his offer since. Catwoman came to ask Batman if he knows anything about Alberto. She knows he's been working together with Penguin on something. She asks him if Penguin has Alberto, and Batman lies, telling her he doesn't know anything. She confesses that she didn't think so, not that she'd much care, just doing a job. Batman remarks that Falcone isn't one to just let bygones be bygones. There must be some catch. Catwoman tells him that there always is, but changes the subject to Robin. She wonders how he's doing, having heard some of what went down the previous night with Scarecrow. Batman tells her he's recovering. Catwoman remarks that Batman needs to be more careful with that boy. Batman agrees, saying that he needs a lot more training. Catwoman disagrees, 
that's not what she's talking about. Robin is more equipped than anyone could have expected. No, she tells him that he needs to be more careful that the boy doesn't end up forever chasing after his approval. She concludes that a father's love can be a terrible thing, then thanks Batman for his help and disappears into the night. Once she's gone, he has a sudden realization. Catwoman is Falcone's daughter. The next day, Dick Grayson comes to in the Batcave. Bruce is sitting at the Bat computer, his arm in a cast, looking frustrated as he works. Dick tries to speak, which gets Bruce's attention. He runs over to him and tells him he's alright. He's safe. Dick sits up, asking how long he's been out. Batman tells him it's been nearly two days. Dick is pissed. Why didn't anyone wake him up? Batman tells him he's lucky to have recovered at all. The amount of toxin he was exposed to would have killed a boy his age without immediate treatment. Hearing their conversation, Alfred rushes in delighted to see Dick awake. He shows him warmth and compassion, which Bruce struggles to do. As Bruce, the player walks over to his workbench and tears off his cast. Dick questions what happened, and Alfred begins to explain everything while Batman places a robotic brace upon his broken arm. Think Batman's weird leg braces from The Dark Knight Rises. As Batman suits up and walks around the cave, the player hears Alfred telling Dick that he hasn't been able to stop Bruce from going out on patrol, so their compromise is that Alfred will mold a cast around Bruce's arm each day, which Batman will tear off each night. Alfred insists that the arm will never heal correctly, but Bruce ignores him. A cinematic triggers when the player is ready to leave the cave to go out on patrol. Dick jumps up from his bed and tells Batman to wait. He wants to join in on the action. Batman spins around and tells him no. He won't let Dick follow the path he went down. He was foolish to have let him get this far. Robin is no more. Dick protests, reminding Bruce that he took down two supervillains alone. Bruce snaps that Scarecrow got away because Dick nearly died, and in the process, sent five cops to the hospital. Dick is silent, and Alfred looks disappointed in Bruce. What? Bruce asks Alfred. You never wanted him to join me out there to begin with. Alfred responds, No, but I wanted something that resembles a family in this house again. Batman walks away, saying, Families are too messy. Once in Gotham, Batman goes on patrol, and it's free roam as usual. After some time, Batman gets a call from Oracle. An alarm has been raised in the GCPD. Batman races over there as quickly as he can, as Oracle describes the situation to him, which she sees through security camera footage. A woman is coming with a bomb strapped to a chest. Once all the police officers surrendered, the GCPD was flooded with Falcone's mob. Batman wonders what Falcone's angle is. This will make him public enemy number one. Unable to sneak inside the GCPD and unwilling to risk the bomb going off, the player uses the underground sewer system beneath the GCPD to sneak in. This section has some Falcone thugs to take down, mostly they're just fodder along the way inside. However, when the player enters the GCPD proper, the woman speaking over the intercom system, the woman with the bomb, realizes that the sewer unit has gone radio silent. She thanks the Batman for coming, adding that she knows exactly how to draw him in, but will he actually be able to finish the job? Batman has no idea who this woman is as she continues unhinged taunts throughout the level. The player has to clear out Falcone thugs throughout the GCPD, freeing police hostages, all while working up to where the woman is stationed with high-value hostages like Gordon. This does earn him some credit with the police force that has been lacking up to this point in his career. Once on the top floor, Batman finds that the woman is tucked into a corner. There's no way he can sneak up on her with full view of the entire room, but notably, all the hostages are gone. Oracle chimes in to let Batman know that they've just all been set free, and Gordon is evacuating everyone as quickly as possible. In order to stall the woman, Batman reveals himself. She perks up. Ready to step into the light? I recognize you from the photo on your father's desk, Batman says. You're Amity Arkham. He could always be sentimental in the least important ways, Amity grins. Well, I've done my job. But while I have you, I do have a question. What job? Did Jeremiah put you up to this? Oh, okay, your question first, Amity smiles. No, he never knew I even came back to this cursed place. What do you mean? That's what I wanted to ask you. You know Gotham houses horrid creatures. You must know all are damned who stay here. 
Apparently, even all who leave are drawn back. This city is cursed, Batman. How can you win? I'm not alone. But you are. There's no one like you. The curse swirls around you, and it seems you like the fight. That makes you predictable. Easy to manipulate to save the man I love. You're the woman from Alberto's car. Batman puts the pieces together. This is all the diversion. Falcone knows where Alberto is being held because you told him. Penguin never should have separated us. Amity grits her teeth. We get nasty when we're not together. I'm going to deactivate that bomb. That's fine. Old man Carmine has been watching us the entire time through this little camera. He knows you're here, which means you're not there. I'm pretty sure the party's already begun. The bomb ticks once and Amity goes silent. The bomb ticks twice and Batman charges forward. The bomb ticks a third time and Amity cries out, Alberto. Batman tears the bomb off of Amity and plummets out a nearby window with her in hand. The bomb detonates. The top floor of the GCPD is blown to smithereens. On the ground, Batman drops Amity off with Gordon, who successfully evacuated the GCPD in time. Without pausing for conversation, Batman makes his way toward the Iceberg Lounge. This wasn't a standard run-of-the-mill operation by Falcone. This was a declaration of all-out war in Gotham City. Rushing to the Bowery, Batman is contacted by the Penguin in a panic. He's putting out an SOS. Falcone's mob is sieging the Iceberg Lounge. When Batman arrives, he discovers a full-blown battle raging on the streets. He looks down at the burning museum, hears the screams of innocent people around him, and grows furious. Before stepping in to stop the violence between the gangsters, he makes sure any civilians caught in the crossfire are rescued. He takes down batches of Falcone and Penguin goons alike, securing escape routes for those caught on the streets, or evacuating others who couldn't escape on their own. After doing about five of these citizen rescues, Batman turns his anger on Falcone's men. He contacts Penguin to tell him he'll handle anyone outside. He suggests Penguin tell his men to retreat, or he'll take them out too. The gunfire quickly stops as all of Penguin's goons retreat inside, leaving a couple dozen armed Falcone thugs, some with inter-gang weaponry, on high alert for Batman to take out. Once that's through, Batman goes to enter the Iceberg Lounge to halt the fighting inside, but is intercepted by a furious Catwoman. She feels betrayed by Batman, now knowing he lied to her about Alberto. They begin a fight that extends across the rooftops of the Bowery. As they run, fight, hide, repeat, Batman tells Catwoman that he would have told her the truth had he pieced together that she was Falcone's daughter by that point. Catwoman tells him to shut up, that he doesn't know anything about her. He's just like Carmine, another father taking advantage of others' affection. When the fight is over, Batman has Catwoman pinned on the rooftop of the Iceberg Lounge. He calls Catwoman by her real name, Selina, revealing for the first time that he knows who she is. He looked into her past and knows Selina grew up an orphan. He doesn't understand the relationship she has with Falcone, but he does understand how she grew up. He explains that Robin isn't his son. He's an orphan who recently lost his parents and feels the same anger Catwoman feels. Batman confesses it's an anger he's all too familiar with as well. Just then, there's a commotion from the ground level. Carmine Falcone and a squadron of his thugs escape from the Iceberg Lounge with a bloodied Alberto in their care. For a split second, Falcone makes eye contact with Catwoman. The trio recognize that Falcone could make a move to save her, but he doesn't take that risk. He secures Alberto and charges forward with his men, betraying and abandoning Selina once again. Batman releases Catwoman, ready to charge after Falcone, but she claws open his chest armor with both hands, knocking him from the roof. The Penguin emerges from the Iceberg Lounge, livid that his new HQ has been damaged so badly. He sees Catwoman fleeing and goes to shoot her with his umbrella, but Batman grabs it out of his hands. The battle has been completely and utterly lost. Even with Penguin's hired help and alliance with Batman, Falcone got the drop on him, in no small part due to his inter-gang weaponry. With little control over his temper, Penguin rages out, declaring that his alliance with Batman is over. Some good it did him, Batman was no use when it came down to it. As the Penguin throws his tantrum, Batman tells him he's sorry he wasn't able to save more lives, 
and walks off. Penguin squawks after him that the repairs will cost far more than a few shallow graves. He'll never forget this. Batman chases after the Falcone caravan and arrives at the main burned out Falcone hideout from the beginning. He perches to watch Alberto being cared for. A doctor and nurse run out, place him on a stretcher, and rush him inside as Carmine chases after them. Batman sits and waits. The night has gotten darker. Batman remains vigilant. Footsteps come up behind him. Batman keeps his eye on Alberto through a window. Robin appears over his shoulder. You can't make me stop. Batman doesn't look back at him. I failed to live up to three promises in just as many nights. Promises to protect children. Amity Arkham nearly died because I was careless. Alberto Falcone is in the one place he hates most, and I nearly lost you. But I'm here, Robin protests. Listen, I'm not doing this for you. I'll do it with or without you, but, you know, I'd prefer to do it with you. At least, for a while. There's little difference between me and those men. I know we're not... I'm not a father, I'm not a role model, and this place, this city may truly be cursed. I don't know if anyone deserves Gotham, but I'm certain you don't. Brute Batman. It doesn't have to be that way. That's the entire point of this, remember? And don't be stupid. You're nothing like Falcone or that creepy Arkham. Don't be so down on yourself. I'm never gonna hate you. You're all I've got. Well, and Alfred, who is infinitely better. Alfred's with me. Batman turns from his perch. I'll get you a dog. A Lamborghini. Robin corrects him. Batman sighs, standing up. You're exhausting, Robin. Let's head back to the Batcave. To the Batcave, Batman agrees. He calls the Batwing to pick them up, stating that for now, Alberto is being cared for and there's not much else he can do for him tonight. The dynamic duo get into the Batwing, and as they settle in, Robin asks, So, what do Alberto and Amity have to do with the lovers anyway? Lightning strikes across the night sky. It's the next night. Batman and Robin burst out of the clouds, plummeting toward Gotham City. The player gets to choose who they want to play as. It's total free roam. Once ready, the player can go to the bat signal. As the characters travel for a while, they will begin talking over their comms, so the player gets some context for the current situation. Batman confirms that he knows exactly what's going on, and that one way or another, Carmine Falcone falls tonight. The mission begins when the heroes arrive at the bat signal, where Gordon is waiting for them. Ah, the one who blew up my building, and the one who nearly killed me. Always a pleasure. Jim. Sorry about that, Captain Gordon. The three get to talking. The conversation is kept vague. It doesn't seem like anyone has the full picture except for Batman. Gordon is helping with Batman's plans, but all he needs to know is where to have his men stationed. Pairs of running patrol cars at strategic intersections around the perimeter of Falcone's hideout to make sure no one escapes. They have to be quick and efficient. They need to move tonight, but they also need to be prepared for other criminal activity, aka whatever Calendar Man has planned. Gordon tells Batman his timing is impeccable, then asks what the kid is going to do while Batman is infiltrating the hideout. Batman says that he's coming with him. He wishes Gordon good luck and leaves. Robin reminds the captain of his name. Right, Robin. Gordon shakes his head. Hey, be careful, kid. The pair traverse through the skyline toward Carmine Falcone's hideout. The player can still play as whoever they'd like. Switching back and forth is an option at all times. Their goal is to sneak in through the burnt out top floor and make their way down to a secret underground basement Batman's sure exists. Robin makes a snide remark about bad guys and their bases. Basements, secret labs, decked out caves with British butlers. But it's mostly played seriously from here as they can't banter back and forth while infiltrating an enemy base. It's a reverse muscle tower. It's Bobbity's ship. We're going down, baby. Level by level fights. Predator encounters, open tag team combat, environmental puzzles to solve. This is just a full-blown Arkham-ass level as both Batman and Robin get some real chonky, sweaty gameplay. The player should be feeling like a well-oiled machine. The intergang weapons don't scare them anymore. They know how to beat them. They know the moves. The player finds the secret basement entrance, travels down, and is immediately faced with mafiosos in miniature versions of Bruno Mannheim's intergang mech suit. These are all the slim, lesser models, but still make the thugs far tougher. 
They can take a lot more damage, they're quick, and they shoot their own types of lasers. Rather than a blast, theirs is more like a beam that lasts three full seconds. Side note, I feel like the cape beatdown would work really well on these guys. Let them fight! When all is said and done, Batman and Robin charge into Carmine's hidden study to confront the Falcones. Once inside, Carmine confronts Batman over his decision to back the freaks over the families. He demands to know why Batman was working with Penguin, why he let him have Alberto all these weeks. Stay back, Carmine. We're here for Alberto. What have you got against my boy? Carmine asks. Alberto lunges forward, plunging a hidden knife into his father's side, then holds him up as a human shield. I just want to leave Gotham. The death of Warden Valdis, and now your own father. I can't let you and Amity walk free. He did, Jeremiah did, for years, decades, parents and children and parents and children. We don't get to walk free? Wrong. We're getting what we want for once. Alberto, why? Carmine squeaks out. You'd be dead already if it wasn't for the bat, Alberto sneers. Carmine is stunned into silence. Alberto. Batman begins, but is interrupted by the building shaking. Instantly, an enormous object comes crashing through the ceiling. Batman and Robin leap out of the way. The Falcones are lost in the smoke and debris. When it all clears, the dynamic duo get to their feet and realize the object is a massive sweetheart candy that reads... Will you be my valentine? Up above, there's a helicopter with an empty winch, and eight men dressed as Cupid with red hunting bows descend toward them on wires. Holy hell! Who are these guys, Batman? Robin asks. Batman simply responds, This is new. Batman and Robin have to fight these weird Cupid guys, which is different, but ultimately wraps up pretty quick. It's obvious that Alberto made a run for it with Carmine by now, but the dynamic duo have more pressing issues. They grapple out of the area to find that Gotham is in chaos. There are four massive Valentine's-themed objects over the skyline. A fireworks display making up giant red heart outlines in the sky, a hot air balloon with a big heart-shaped balloon, a billow of pink smoke, an enlarged billboard advertising a honeymoon suite. Batman and Robin look at each other and just say, Calendar Man. Let's split up, Robin declares. Only if you ask for help if you need it, Batman responds. Does that rule apply both ways? I'll do my best. Me too. This next portion of the game will have Batman and Robin swapping back and forth between levels. Throughout all of Gotham, Calendar Man has hacked into televisions, making his holiday announcement to the entire city. It's clear that he's going absolutely insano mode. He has something to prove, and has scaled up his crimes to a level he's never come close to. Alfred makes the heroes aware of the four emergencies throughout Gotham. There's a crisis in the honeymoon suite of the biggest hotel in Gotham. There's a bomb in the carnival's tunnel of love. The wedding of Mayor Grange and Thomas Elliot has been taken hostage. The circus is on fire. That's the order the player has to tackle the levels in, starting with Batman at the hotel. With that said, let the games begin. As Batman makes his way to the hotel, he gets intel from Alfred about what's going on inside. Apparently, it's overrun with rats, and for some reason, people cannot get out. When Batman arrives, he sees what the problem is. A giant quilt is wrapped around the base of the hotel, trapping everyone inside with the rats. Listen, there are two fun villains that could actually pose a realistic, but obviously lesser threat to Batman, and their rat catcher and crazy quilt. Now, I know these are joke characters to a lot of people, and they wouldn't be some dark, twisted interpretation, but they do exist within the Arkham universe, so why not show off some of Batman's weirder characters? Ratcatcher is gross. Having rats running around and tormenting people in a hotel is so funny to me, like a horrible crime to commit, but it's so ludicrous that it works. His design could also be really fun, with a good number of extermination-themed thugs to keep Batman occupied as he makes his way up the hotel. Crazy Quilt is mostly just there for support. Ratcatcher can torture people, but he needs Crazy Quilt to keep them inside. How can an average person tear through a massive thick quilt, covering an entire building with what they have on them or can find in a hotel lobby? I think this is a pretty good role for his character. The level itself would begin with Batman busting in through a window near the top floor. 
On his belt would be some kind of noise signal thing that attracts rats. Yes, very comic booky. But Batman would have faced Ratcatcher before and be prepared for this situation. He needs to lure the rats away from the citizens while concentrating his efforts on stopping Ratcatcher. As Batman fights his way through the hotel, the rats from the first level are slowly making their way toward him. So much so that by the time he gets to the final confrontation with Ratcatcher and Crazy Quilt, the floor is a sea of rats. They stand in a small circle free of rats thanks to Ratcatcher's control, which makes their fight pretty close quarters. If Batman gets too close to the edge, he gets nipped. I think having Batman face two of his goofier villains at the same time would make for a fun boss fight. Ratcatcher can use his extermination gear to spray Batman with toxic gas throughout the fight. Crazy Quilt can be fighting with long, sharp quilting needles. Once they're both defeated, the rats snap out of Ratcatcher's control and disperse. Meanwhile, the GCPD has burned through the quilt on the first floor, allowing everyone to come pouring out before the rats also escape onto the streets. Next up, Robin heads to the Tunnel of Love. Calendar Man has a good deal of hired thugs destroying the carnival. When Robin arrives, the entire area is in a panic as NPCs run for their lives. Robin goes through most of the carnival, taking out the goons that get in his way, but his primary goal is deactivating the bomb in the tunnel. The villain in charge of the bomb could just be someone like Electrocutioner. Wait, he dead. Or, I don't know. Bomb is pretty easy. Robin could just roll up to the Tunnel of Love and literally see some wimpy looking guy. Yeah, let's do that. There's no one else to fight, it's just this dork telling Robin to stand back. Robin tells him to drop the bomb, but the wimp panics, saying that he can't, he's stuck. Robin says, Listen, sorry, but I don't trust you, so I'm gonna knock you out. You'll be fine in a couple of hours. Oh damn it, what a brat! The wimp turns into Clayface, and now Robin's gotta fight him in this tunnel? Come on, tell me that wouldn't be fun. I gotcha, right? Acting. So Robin's best gadget to use during this fight would be the glue grenade. It doesn't trap Clayface for long, but does force him to change his body to get free, which gives Robin opportunities to do some damage. The fight goes on until the bomb timer begins ticking loudly in the final 30 seconds. Clayface mocks Robin, saying that no one will be able to survive except for him. His body's durability makes him practically immune from explosive damage. Robin thanks him for the tip, and the final act of the boss fight is Robin stuffing the bomb inside Clayface's body and using the few seconds remaining to constantly glue Clayface up so that he can't morph to get the bomb out of him. It explodes blowing Clayface up like a pufferfish, but there's no exterior damage. Clayface collapses, practically melting as smoke emits from his mouth. Robin smirks, satisfied with his victory. Switching back to Batman, he makes his way to Gotham's historic cathedral for the wedding of Mayor Marion Grange and Thomas Elliot. When Batman arrives, he sees that all wedding guests are suffering from fear hallucinations. That's right, it's time to bring Scarecrow back. He wasn't captured in the aftermath of his conflict with Robin, and I think having him interacting with Batman would justify his continued inclusion. Unfortunately for the wedding guests and first responders, they've all been swayed by Scarecrow's hallucinogen and try to kill Batman in a fear frenzy. As Batman fights deeper into the church, he and Scarecrow can have some fun banter about how Crane has already been defeated by Robin, with Batman also angered at Scarecrow for the condition his toxin put Robin in. With Batman wearing a gas mask, Scarecrow's toxin isn't able to affect him. Instead, what sets this mission apart from Scarecrow's first mission is everyone else is affected and Batman needs to stop them. This all comes to a head when Batman comes face to face with the lovely couple, Tommy and Marion, under Scarecrow's control and Batman has to fight them both. I think this could be a really interesting time to showcase the psyche of Tommy Elliot. We all know where his story goes, we know he's not right in the head, but this is the first canonical hint of something disturbing under the surface. He reacts to the fear toxin in such a visceral way that he becomes more of a threat to Batman than expected. It would be fun to make it clear that Tommy is having some fear reaction to visions of his parents also ranting about how perfect Bruce Wayne's life is. Batman obviously thinks that's strange, but can't say anything about it. Since Batman is trying to take it easy on everyone, he has a bit of a challenge with Tommy, but ultimately takes him down. Afterwards, Batman interrogates Scarecrow to find out that Calendar Man promised him the chemicals he was after if he succeeded at this job. Batman tells him to find another hobby and knocks him out. 
paramedics come to treat everyone as Batman leaves. The final Calendar Man crime that needs to be stopped is the burning of the circus. Of all the locations, this seems to fit the Valentine's Day theme least of all. Why is it included? Well, Robin can't help but think about what the circus means to him, and this isn't lost on Batman. Robin insisted on tackling this one, and Batman agreed, telling him he'd catch up when he could. When it comes to anything burning in Gotham, Batman, Robin, and the player know that can only mean one thing. Firefly. But when Robin arrives at the circus, he finds that it's entirely empty. It's not at all like the carnival with all the fleeing citizens. There's no madman burning everything in sight. The area surrounding the big tent is all ablaze, but the tent itself looks untouched. There's a chorus of screams coming from inside. When Robin enters, he finds a captive audience all strapped into seats against their will and unable to escape. A spotlight from up above suddenly turns on. Drums start rolling. A voice, thick with a Brooklyn accent, announces, Ladies and gentlemen, we are about to take you on a journey. The spotlight travels down to the center of the circus floor, where a man, clad in classic ringmaster attire, stands. Welcome to the show! We've got a good one for you this romantic evening. Release the clowns. The Joker laughs, taking a bow while three clown cars blow through the tent. From each, a dozen clown-themed goons emerge. Yes, that's right. It wouldn't be an Arkham game without some Joker involvement. As Robin is fighting, we get exposition from the Joker, happily performing a little jig to some circus music on his pedestal, that he was hoping the sidekick would show up. He'd heard Batman has been running around with someone new, and at first the Joker was jealous, agreeing to participate in Calendar Man's little game for free just to offer Batman this little valentine. However, now that he sees Robin is some worthless kid, he couldn't care less. Robin responds that he thought the Joker would be, you know, at least a little funny. Joker isn't amused. After Robin has defeated the thugs, Joker steps over to a young couple clad in circus attire. We could go trapeze attire if we want to be very on the nose. They're tied up at a dining table. Joker holds up a serving dish between them. When Robin rushes forward to capture him, Joker removes the lid, revealing a gun. Uh, 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 Joker tisks. Let's test the new meat with a pop quiz. In this show that you've been foolish enough to join, who do we kill first? Ladies or gentlemen. No one has to die, Robin pleads. Oh, that's sweet, Joker smiles. But you'll learn tonight, someone always has to die. He puts the gun against the woman's temple as she cries. Robin whips out a shuriken to try and stop Joker, but just then, Batman tears through the top of the circus tent, plummeting directly onto the clown prince of crime. Robin hurries to untie the hostages as Joker looks so pleased to see Batman. He laughs, asking him if he should have just gotten him flowers and chocolates instead. Batman tells him that he's going back to Arkham where he belongs. Joker tells him he doesn't think so. Oh, Harley! Harley. Batman looks confused. You got it, Mr. J. Harley makes her debut in her classic outfit. She's standing in the highest row of the stands, holding a torch which she uses to ignite the back of the tent. Batman looks back to the Joker, who says, You've got a sidekick, now I've got one too. Although, you should be a bit more careful who sees you with the boy, Bats. People might get the wrong idea. Ha ha, ha ha ha! Batman punches him unconscious. Mr. J was right about you. You're just a big bully, Harley shouts. Robin, make sure she doesn't do any more damage. I'm going to free these people. Here we have a good old fashioned boss fight in a burning circus between Robin and Harley Quinn, equipped with her trusty mallet. As the fight progresses, Batman is using his hacking skills to release the binds trapping the audience members, progressively clearing out the tent. Once all is said and done, Robin manages to defeat Harley at about the same time Batman frees all the citizens. Looking back, the Joker has vanished. Batman tells Robin to forget about him. He runs over and throws the unconscious Harley over his shoulder, shouting that they need to get out of here right now. The area around the tent is cleared out as escaped citizens continue to flee. The tent crashes down behind the heroes, engulfed in flames. Robin silently watches the fire rage. Batman 
finishes tying an unconscious Harley against a lamppost, then walks over and places a hand on Robin's shoulder. It isn't over yet. The clock tower, jutting out of the horizon, has been wrapped in giant plants which have cracked the building apart. It's clear they're the only thing holding the clock tower in place. Batman and Robin make their way across the city, which is in chaos. The entire open world should be aesthetically different now. Alarms, sirens, police, crowds moving quickly, people in a panic, a city in danger. This city is cursed, Batman. How can you win? The words of Amity Arkham echo in Batman's mind. The clock strikes midnight as the heroes arrive. The outside of the tower is impenetrable through the plants, forcing Batman and Robin to go through an opening at the base, purposely left for them. Once inside, the players have to fight through 365 goons across 12 levels, each level representing a month of the year through cosmetic decorations. Too much? No. We're going crazy with it. Batman and Robin fight up this tower through combat and predator challenges. Some puzzles here or there, you know the drill. But the fun of this mission is just the absurdity and excess. A truly insane gauntlet to save the day from a madman. Once Batman and Robin arrive at the top, it's decorated like a New Year's celebration. Amity Arkham is strung up on the big hand of the clock, which has been stuck at midnight. The clock tower glass has been shattered, and Amity dangles from the clock above the chaotic streets. Calendar Man greets the dynamic duo, asking, Have you enjoyed your holiday? You've gone too far, Julian, Batman growls. You can never go too far where love is concerned, Calendar Man says. You know, I was angry about the copycats. I had to know who they were. I told you that. Did you never consider, detective, that I could come to the same conclusion as you? The Warden's murder had nothing to do with you, Batman protests. Wrong, Batman. Messages are important. I won't allow any fraud stealing what is mine. After tonight, people will always know about me. People will remember the Calendar Man. They'll remember the pain, not the madman. Well, at least I'm certain this will be a day he will never forget. Calendar Man activates a hidden switch he had rigged up, exploding a New Year's confetti popper near Robin, spraying him with poison ivy pheromones. Oh, come on! Robin wafts away the gas, coughing as his eyes glow green and his personality fades. Happy New Year, Calendar Man whispers. Your resolution? Kill the Batman. As Robin, the player now has to fight Batman. Rather than hitting you back, Batman is simply difficult to land a hit on. He's countering all your moves. He can throw you around, but at first does no real damage. However, if the player can effectively use a gadget on Batman, you can throw him off his game for a second to hurt him. Each time the player lands a solid hit, Batman gets a bit more aggressive and tougher. All the while, Calendar Man is just having an exposition monologue extravaganza. Oh, how he taunts Batman so, telling him all about his plans. Here are some juicy nuggets the player gets. Calendar Man was behind the ventriloquist bank heist. It was supposed to be funding for this scheme, but when that failed, he had to organize separate operations in three smaller banks outside of Gotham. He's had White Rabbit tailing Batman for days, acquiring tidbits of info from Batman's activities so he could figure out who the lovers are. He feels such hatred for them, viewing them as trying to replace him. White Rabbit is how he was able to break Amity out of jail and bring her to the clock tower. She's also how he came to know of the plant woman, Poison Ivy. In her situation, she was desperate for some help, and I'm quite generous, Calendar Man tells Batman. And as the fight enters its final stage, Calendar Man monologues about the love between fathers and sons. Fathers and their sons. Complicated love. My father always took me to the circus on my birthday, the one day of the year he showed me any kindness. Of course, I hated the circus. I killed him on my 16th birthday, but I miss him every now and then. Complicated love. The boy will understand soon. 
The fight ends after five rounds of a battle between these two, getting more intense until Robin delivers a near devastating blow to Batman that Batman is forced to counter with his own serious blow. With Amity's life on the line, he has to act fast and breaks Robin's arm, snapping him out of the pheromone state through agonizing pain. Calendar Man is pissed and goes to shoot Robin, but Batman steps in front of the bullet while Robin gets his head on straight. Wounded and bleeding badly, Batman frees Amity. Panicking, Calendar Man goes to shoot at him, but Robin swoops in to knock Calendar Man out at the last minute, finally ending his night of terror. With the day seemingly saved, the dynamic duo take in their triumph for just a moment, long enough for Amity to stab Robin in the back and take him hostage with Calendar Man's knife. Amity says that she doesn't mean Robin any harm. Batman counters that she can't be trusted, what she did to Warden Valdis was monstrous. He wants to know why she killed him. She retorts that Valdis was the real monster. She knew him when she was young, when Valdis worked under Jeremiah at Arkham Asylum. Valdis did horrible things to her mother. She saw it happen once. She knew Valdis is the one who cast the curse on her mother. He's the reason she was never the same until she died. And now, he had the nerve to reopen that cursed place with her family's name, he had to die. Alberto emerges from the shadows, telling Amity to remain calm. He assures Batman no harm will come to Robin, but Batman knows their secret. They need to know that he won't tell the authorities, so they're taking Robin as insurance. Batman pleads with them to take him instead, that he'll go willingly. The lovers ask if he thinks they're stupid. He's in no position to bargain. Batman asks which situation they think will be safer for them. A world where Batman is looking for them, or one where Robin is. This gets their wheels spinning while Robin marinates in the sting of that comment. The lovers conclude that Robin is nothing without Batman, and Batman is subtly driving that narrative. He assures them that Robin is too inexperienced to find them. He doesn't even let Robin drive the Batmobile or have free access to his data. The lovers take the bait, deciding to kidnap him instead, leaving Robin behind, who is still suffering from all the pain he's endured and the pheromone side effects. He slowly loses consciousness as he begs Batman to do something, to work some magic and escape. Batman tells him that he's too injured. He isn't going to try anything. The lovers take him away into the night. Cut to black. Dick wakes up a few hours later. It's early morning and he's being cared for by Alfred, parked in his car in a back alley. When Dick comes to, Alfred is sewing up the knife wound he took from Amity. His arm has already been wrapped up in one of Batman's bionic braces. Alfred immediately says, you're going to be okay, where's Bruce? Dick struggles to come to his senses. Alfred wipes his face with a damp towel and says, Dick, I know you're hurting, but damn it, I need to know. Dick snaps too and says he doesn't know, but it was Alberto and Amity. Alfred asks if he can find them. Dick hesitates, then says that he knows where to start. Alfred helps getting him onto his feet and encourages him to get going. Time is of the essence. The player takes control of Robin, jumping across the rooftops with the sun rising on Gotham. For the first time in series history, you play during the day. The mission is to return to the scene where Bruce was taken, but the clock tower has crumbled. It's become a disaster zone with emergency services everywhere. Robin has to sneak around, careful not to alert anyone to his presence. It's during this time that Robin also pieces together that Alfred had to carry him out of the crumbling tower without being seen. He can't help but feel impressed. Once inside the base of the clock tower, Robin tries to pick up a trail that Bruce secretly left for him but he sees nothing. He realizes that Batman isn't gonna help him with this one. He's on his own. He figures out how to follow Bruce's DNA, adjusting his detective vision to pick up the trail, but he gets blocked in by police, and he can't figure out a good way to leave without being seen. Robin asks Oracle, who has already been caught up to speed by Alfred, to call Gordon, who he now knows is her dad, to give him a message. Oracle isn't sure if she should talk to Gordon directly, but Robin pleads that he needs her to do this for him. Oracle overcomes her reluctance, and the player hears Gordon answer his cell phone. He doesn't much appreciate the tone he's being spoken to in, but when he realizes the call is about a favor for Robin, 
the kid, as Gordon refers to him. Then he makes up an excuse to temporarily clear out some cops from the area so Robin can escape unseen. Following the trail leads Robin to a road where he tracks tire marks to Alberto and Amity's location, some small time Falcone safe house. The only people here are Amity and Alberto, but they are in close quarters and have Batman at their mercy. They are using the safe house to rest for a bit and also to steal some of Falcone's money from a safe that Alberto is confident he can get into, but hasn't been able to yet. It's both easy for Robin to be spotted and for the lovers to kill Batman before he could stop them. So this is a stealth based puzzle where the mission is to create the perfect opportunity for a double stealth takedown using some environmental manipulation gameplay. I'm not gonna design the intricacies now. Throughout the player's time setting this up, we get a lot of exposition on these two lovers to explain their ongoing role in the background of the entire story. Alberto and Amity are psychotic, going back and forth between lovey-dovey speak and fiery shouting matches. We find out that Alberto and Amity have been living together in secret for over a month, they've been secret lovers for years, and finally escaped to a quiet life together, but Alberto kept having dreams of killing his father dreams that became an obsession. Amity had escaped from her father years ago because of his emotional shallowness, but as the most unstable of the pair, was supportive of Alberto following his dreams. However, Amity did not want to come back to Gotham, to a cursed city for a wicked purpose. But Alberto dragged her along just for a day, he claimed leaving Amity at a bar while Alberto went to scope out his father's hideout. While there, she saw Valdis, who didn't recognize her after 20 years. She couldn't resist. She felt the curse swirling around her. It was easy to get Valdis to invite her to his apartment, even easier to kill him when she lost control. Meanwhile, Alberto realized his father was too secure in his hideout to take down and sabotage the area, preparing to burn the hideout to flush his father out. When Alberto returned to Amity and she told him about Valdis, he scrambled to take advantage of the situation. Alberto ran to a party supply store, making the scene reminiscent of one of the Gotham freaks to ensure Batman would personally investigate the killing. After the police left the scene, Alberto made sure to leave a note pointing to his father, trying to start a fire under Batman to take Carmine down. After confirming Batman had investigated their crime scene, Alberto executed on his hideout sabotage. Then, his plan was to sit back and wait for an opportunity. Alberto merely wanted to push the first domino and watch the rest fall into place. And it worked! Until they were discovered by Penguin. Panicked, Amity did the one thing she knew could work. She went to Carmine for his help. He knew her vaguely through their family connection, but didn't know she was in a relationship with Alberto. She told Carmine that Penguin had been holding them both captive for weeks, reinforcing his false belief so that Carmine would help without suspecting something sinister from Alberto. The player knows the rest. So once everything is lined up, Robin clocks both of them in their nogs and knocks them out. He frees Batman and tells him they've got to get him home for treatment. By the end of this story, it's clear Batman has come to accept the comfort of having a family again. Robin calls Alfred as he carries Batman out of the hideout on his shoulder. Police sirens can be heard in the distance. The day is saved. Alberto and Amity lay across one another, unconscious on the floor. News footage of Captain James Gordon's arrest of the criminal kingpin Carmine Falcone blasts on screen. A summation of the events of the night play out. Carmine was mysteriously dropped off at the hospital after he was stabbed. His life was saved, then he was charged for a number of crimes, including the recent bombing of the GCPD headquarters. His son, Alberto Falcone, and his lover, Amity Arkham, are in police custody following their own crime spree. The wedding of Mayor Grange and Thomas Elliott has been called off, with Tommy vanishing from the public eye. A heavily armored caravan cuts through Gotham, 
bringing about a half dozen supervillains from the previous night to Arkham Asylum. Rumor has it, philanthropist Quincy Sharp is eyeing the vacant warden position for himself. The Joker was the only one who escaped police custody, even freeing his partner in crime, the mysterious Harley Quinn, by hijacking her medical transport. Vicki Vale reports that the mastermind behind the Valentine's crime spree remains unknown. The police have ruled out Calendar Man as a suspect. Rumors are now circulating that perhaps it was all the Joker's doing. We see Calendar Man stewing in his cell watching the news, damning the police and Batman for purposely keeping his name out of the story. He freaks out, screaming that it isn't fair. Cut to the rooftop of the GCPD's temporary headquarters. Batman and Robin are perched above, watching Alberto and Amity separated by law enforcement. Alberto is being sent to Blackgate, Amity is being sent to Arkham. Batman reflects on our words about Gotham being cursed once more. In the end, their cars drive in separate directions, severing their bond as Batman and Robin stand together, united with the bat signal shining behind them. And that's the game, mostly. From here, it's free roam time. You've played a game before, surely you know how this works. Time to finish what you haven't done yet. Oh, there are two more things I should add. I don't think the Arkham games did a very good job of having post main campaign content with their stories. What I mean is, there aren't very many side missions that become available only in the post game. A good example of one time they did that really well was the Catwoman mini campaign, taking on Two-Face in Arkham City, and arguably some missions in the Arkham Knight season of Infamy. But that's all technically DLC anyway. So what I'd like to add into the story are two optional but heavily relevant side missions that the player can only start after completing the main story. I want to use these missions to wrap up some loose threads and set up some possible developments for the future. Let's start with the Poison Ivy side mission. Batman is obviously going to be curious about this woman. She is very powerful and popped up in his life twice in the same week. So he starts investigating locations around the city where she clearly has been. Crime scenes, mostly. Think the Hush mission in Arkham City, except with far more plants. Ultimately, he unravels a little story about Ivy, going from being desperate and struggling to seeking some sort of vengeance. The last location Batman finds is an abandoned laboratory, where it's clear Poison Ivy is attempting to create some lethal chemical using her biology, setting her up to be a major threat in the future. The Catwoman mission is a bit more relevant to the story, serving as a real epilogue. Batman discovers a series of robberies around town. After investigating three of them, he comes to a conclusion about where the next one will be. The robberies have all been undertaken on Falcone-owned properties, which are in shambles due to being leaderless. When Batman goes to the location he knows will be robbed next, he's spotted because the Falcone mobsters are also expecting someone to come. So Batman has to clear out the hideout, only to discover Catwoman watching him exactly who he knew would be there. The two don't fight. They just get to talking. Batman tells Catwoman that she did the right thing. He knows that she's the one who brought Carmine to the hospital. She responds that she should have let him bleed out, but it became too pathetic to watch. Batman tells her he knows she's leaving town, then asks where she'll go. Catwoman tells him that she doesn't know. She just needs to get away for a while, to get her head on straight. Batman struggles to tell her that she doesn't have to go. He could try and make her feel at home as part of his family. Catwoman sighs, telling Batman there are plenty of other women in Gotham. Batman tells her that it wouldn't be right to bring them into this. We're already here. The timing just isn't right. Catwoman can't accept. She isn't ready. She turns from him and goes to the rooftop's edge. Looking back over her shoulder, she asks Batman if he'll still be in Gotham when she returns. He tells her that he'll always be here. She smiles and vanishes into the night. And that's it, folks. That's the end of the story. As insanely long and not well put together this video has been, it's also been a hell of a fun time for me. I know it's not perfect, 
but I'm pretty happy with it. I think this is a game that I'd like to play. I think a game focusing on Batman's relationships in this period where he would be building them is an interesting concept. I love the idea of tying that into Valentine's Day, and of course, Calendar Man is a villain that deserved more than the original games gave him. I love the idea of him serving as this enormous, over-the-top threat. The idea to use him with a Valentine's Day theme was actually inspired by a comment I got on a community post, so shout out to you! The Arkham tradition that I alluded to breaking in the beginning was my use of the Joker. I had to include the Joker, people would say it wasn't an Arkham game without him, but I did not want him to be the focus once again. I struggled to find a good way to balance that, and I think I settled in a good place. It was a fun setting for Joker, it had some Batman relationship stuff, and served as both Robin's introduction to Joker and the overall introduction of Harley Quinn. It may have left people wanting more, but hey, he was just involved for a laugh, this wasn't a Joker master plan, and he got to have fun in a supporting role. The idea of the lovers being copycats of Calendar Man was there from day one, and it was consistently the most difficult plotline for me to unravel since they are entirely new iterations of these characters. I think each of them brings a fun dimension to the story. I like the idea of Amity planting the seed in Batman's head about a dark, supernatural force in Gotham. It kind of retroactively makes the atmosphere of Arkham Asylum a bit more impactful on the Batman character. Alberto's lust to kill his father was a fun driving force when compared to Batman and Robin's relationship. I mean, the whole story is about love. Romantic, familial, platonic. So I needed to make sure the villains that kicked it off were primarily driven by emotion. I'm curious what the response to that storyline will be. The Metropolis and Superman stuff was just too good for me not to have fun with. It was perhaps a bit indulgent, but if I was playing this game and suddenly told I got to explore Metropolis, I'd be hyped. Then having Batman essentially use Superman as an extension of his utility belt in the finale was a damn fun moment. I think people have always wanted to see this Batman interacting with other heroes, and I think in a story about Batman's growth, his relationships, and coming to terms with his position as a role model was as good a time as any to introduce Superman. The Robin stuff was really fun to write. I know in my Arkham Knight rewrite, there were some people who were upset that I wrote Robin into so much of the gameplay and story. The criticism was primarily that it felt too much like a Robin game. Personally, I think that criticism was silly given the scope of the story and his minor inclusion, but for this game, I tried to strike a good balance. I wanted this to still be a Batman game, but one that finally utilizes Robin well and gives him his own story that progresses the overall narrative of the franchise. The place Batman is in at the end of this game explains why he would go on to form an extended family. We even get the beginnings of Barbara's role in it and Gordon becoming more central. This isn't the Batman we meet in Arkham Asylum. Beaten down, jaded, keeping his loved ones at an arm's reach. One of the special things to me about the Arkham canon is the tragedy of this Batman. He's a version of the character with so much history whose experiences seem to actually weigh on him throughout the years. Look at how angry and volatile he is when he starts his crusade, then how reserved and toxically protective of his loved ones he is by the time night rolls around. Because we know Batman builds a family, that means there's an arc there that we have never seen. My Arkham Origins trilogy is all about Batman accepting others into his life seeing the value family can have, and how that love can make him stronger, all before those feelings are buried by tragedy after tragedy. Oh yeah, I said trilogy. Welp, thanks so much for watching this insanity, and take care.